Welcome to the Sherdog Radio Network preview for UFC on ESPN 54, Blanchfield versus Fjord, also known as UFC Atlantic City. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of Sherdog.com. With me, as usual, is Keith Schillen, the executive producer of the Sherdog Radio Network. Keith, how you doing this evening? I'm doing good, man. How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm glad we actually got to uh, talk tonight at all. I, I mean, is the the mishap at the Schillen household yeah. anything like worth <laughs> some story time? Like, what's going on over there? No, I, I expected to see you in like some some hip waiters, you know? Yeah. So we had, a, we had So I'll tell the listeners, I I didn't get to do as much tapes last minute tape study as I like to, as we had a, um, a plumbing problem, and. And long story short, all the pressure to my sink wasn't working. We weren't getting any water in my sink. And my wife's like, ah, this can't wait. I have dishes. I have things to do. So um, luckily, it we had a blockage. And I was able – so it's kind of hard to explain, but there's – you know, the, the – Pipe, depending on where the blockage in the pipe is, depends how far you got to go back. Mm-hmm. Luckily, it was right the very first thing I cut and replaced. So um saved me a lot of time. But, you know, I tried doing all the other stuff first, you know, clean the aerators, check the valves, do all that stuff. But, um, yeah, I lucked out. I lucked, I lucked out. But uh, because of that, uh, some, of the, some of the stuff that I wasn't uh, – some of the stuff I was expecting to do, I still haven't finished the NCAA wrestling tournament. So that – that that's a priority tomorrow after getting this out Stret, stretching um, it out yeah uh, i mean it is what it is it's i mean it's life of a homeowner you you, you constantly i mean you never know i mean you know you're never not fixing something uh speaking of fixing things uh fix this card uh like we got 14 fights we got a possible title eliminator at the top uh how do you feel about it as a whole you know like what's your level of anticipation I like it. I mean, I can like a B minus. Like at this point now, adding live crowds seems like such a special thing now. But it was an everyday event that it it naturally boosts the card up. I think based on the last two cards we had, Apex cards. I mean, especially the one two weeks ago, the Tybora one. It was so weak that it, this makes this seem better. It is a little weird to have back to back weeks where you know female flyweights. Are headlining. Uh, that, that's a little strange, but they got. I mean, they got some big names on this. I mean, obviously Vicente Luque is, is a big name in the co-main event. Chris Weidman, obviously former champion. I mean, take take that for worth. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, there's some action fights. Overall, I, I think it's a pretty good card. So I'll go like a B minus for a fight night. I, I agree. Uh, we got 14 fights on the card. Uh, I think that's too many. If you had to Agreed. remove one fight from the card, which one you pulling? Which is your peremptory challenge, as like you know, a, a courtroom would call it? All right, I wasn't ready for that. Let me look real quick. Um, oh, oh, it's obvious. Dennis Bazooka and Connor Matthews. Boom. That should be yeah. a yeah. That should be a CES fight. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm with you there. Uh, <clears throat> any other general thoughts about this one before we dive right in? No, let's get into it. We got a lot. We got a lot of fights. All right. <laughs> Not too much story time this week. <laughs> First up at UFC Atlantic City is a light heavyweight matchup between the debuting Ibo Aslan and Anton Turkali. Aslan, the 27-year-old Turk, is 12-1 and overall. He fought on the Contender Series back in August, knocking out Paulo Hinato Jr. in the first round. That was good enough to punch his ticket to uh, the UFC, where a familiar face will await him in the form of Turkali. Uh, Turkali, 27-year-old Swede, 8-3 and overall, uh, 0-3 in the UFC. He won on the Contender Series in Season 6 back in July of 2022. Since then, he has losses to Jailton Almeida, Vitor Petrino, and Tyson Pedro. The most recent of those, the Pedro fight, was at UFC 293 back in September. So uh, he's still looking to get uh, his first win in the UFC as well. This fight, for what it's worth, is a dead pick em. Both men are out there, minus 110, minus 115 or so. Uh, as I alluded to, these two gentlemen have always already fought. Uh, Aslan's only career loss came to Anton Turkali in uh, Brave CF back in August of 2020. Uh, since then, he's you know rattled off four wins in a row, including the Contender Series win. So I, he's earned his way back. I figure going back to that fight is a pretty valid, at least, lead-in to scouting this one. 
And you go back and watch that fight. Honestly, if I had watched that fight in August of 2020, I would not have guessed that either of those guys would end up in the UFC. To be perfectly honest, neither of them look like UFC material. Uh, Anton Tercali at least continues to bear that out, but it was a real fun fight, mostly because neither guy really knew how to defend himself. Uh, most of the first round was Aslan lighting Tercali up on the feet because uh, Tercali was so much slower and his striking defense was so bad. Then in the second round, Tercali took Aslan down easily because Aslan's takedown defense was terrible. Tercali roughed him up a little bit. And I, I don't mean this to be insulting because I am a white belt myself, but just tapped him out with a white belt re rear naked choke. Uh, I mean, that's it. They, they looked like two mildly intriguing 23-year-old prospects, neither of whom looked great. They're both in the UFC now. Uh, I'll give us on this. He's a hard hitter, and he he is aggressive enough that he gives himself every possible chance to put that uh, put that power on his opponent's chin. If he if he tops out ever into a top ten light heavyweight, it's going to be as kind of a a poor man's Vulcan news Demir. Uh, like, you know, he presents as a kickboxer, calls himself as a kickboxer, but mostly what he is is a slugger with good power in both hands. He throws very hard kicks, but not very many of them. Just, and other than that is just sort of a big, strong guy at 205. Just very much from the the bread and butter Vulcan Uzdemir mold, and that was good enough to get Uzdemir into the, the top 10 for several years. But it's hard to tell whether Aslan has developed that much from the guy who lost to Turkali because all of his fights since then are like 30 second to two minute knockouts and nobody's really tried to take him down except in desperation once he's rung him up real bad uh Turkali for what it's worth I mean he's probably improved marginally since then but it's hard to say he's improved a ton. And it's it's hard to say how much he's improved because he's been so overmatched by his UFC competition. Like, uh, Jails and Almeida and Vitor Petrino were two tough asks. And the Almeida fight was at 215 pounds as Almeida was on his way to like 245. So that's really unfair to, to judge him by. But basically, Tercali seems like kind of a finesse grappler without the real physical horsepower to make it work on, on UFC level light heavyweights. I mean, these guys both seem to be maybe slightly refined versions of the fighters. They were, you know, three and a half, four years ago, this fight, their first fight could easily have gone the way of, of Aslan. He hurt Turkali multiple times in, in their first fight before Turkali caught him. I'm, I'm leaning for that to happen again. Like Turkali has at least been in there against and preparing for a higher level of fighter than Aslan has been fighting. So I'm going to say that the you know first time octagon jitters get to Aslan a little bit, the desperation, I know this is my last chance, motivates Turkali a little bit. And this fight looks about like the first one. Like Turkali probably is going to get some stuff he doesn't like coming his way on the feet. I don't think Aslan will be able to stop the takedown whether it's from kind of just a sloppy shot like it was in their first fight or Takali just manages to get into the clinch and, and kind of trip Aslan down. But I haven't seen anything to indicate that Aslan is much better at taking care of himself on the ground than he was in 2020. So give me Takali by second round submission again. Yeah, so um, <laughs> if you guys see me, <laughs> I don't know why I do this. When I was looking to the left a lot over here, so I have two computers here. This is like, this is my computer I only do for podcasts. And this one I do my everyday life and this is where I do my notes and everything. So uh, I always forget to send my notes from this computer to here. So I'm not looking like this the whole time. And uh, so I don't know, we've done this show like, uh, I don't know, 500 times. And <laughs> I still like almost weekly forget to do it. And then this week, I'm like, man, I sent it to me. Why isn't I getting it? And I realized I did not send it to me. I, I actually sent my notes to you, Ben. So oh, um, <laughs> dude, just, just, just pull out a, a, a New England accent and just do it. Play both of us, man. I'll take off. Outstanding. So, yeah. Like, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll be wicked good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I, I and while I'm doing that, I'm not even uh, I'm, not, I'm not even on the fight. I'm, I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, this is what a day this has been. Uh, I mean, 
it, of all the people to put him in, in in his UFC debut, why give him the guy that he's already fought? That that didn't make sense to me. But it is what it is. What it is. Uh, to Kelly, he's he's not a great athlete. I mean, he stands up way too tall for my liking. He, he's a bit of a brawler, but he lacks power and he he throws too many arm punches. He he does have good output though, and he attacks with combination. He throws hard calf kicks, but but often won't set them up with any other strikes. He has terrible striking defense. I mean, he's a very hittable guy. I am worried about his chin. I mean, go back to his recent fight. He got knocked out by Tyson Pedro. Uh, you move over to Aslan. The guy's 27, so I like that. He's a striker. Pretty aggressive, though. I, You know, he's, he's a very plodding, flat-footed kind of guy. But he has power. I mean, he always wins by KO. He's got seven of them in the first round. But you mentioned it, dude. He's faced tomato cans. <laughs> You know, um, he's he's a he's a hold your ground type fighter where he's not going to really back up. He's going to bite down on his on his mouthpiece and just swing. But because of that, he doesn't move his head. He's, he's very hittable. Now, I like his kicking game. Pretty good kicking game. He's got some mean leg kicks. He likes switch kicks. I, I haven't seen too much of his ground except him getting subbed, you know, in his one loss. The Kelly already beat him, but I'm not high on him at all. <sighs> I, I I think Aslan's record looks much better than his skills. He's not a guy that, that I'm excited about his addition to the UFC or so far. Aslan can crack. Takali has durability issues. I'm gonna say Aslan gets it done. Uh, give me give me Aslan my first round TKO. Next up, middleweights take the cage as Chidi and Jokuwani tries to get things back on track against Reese McKee. And Jokwani, the 35-year-old uh, Nigerian-American by way of Las Vegas, is 22-10 and 10 with one no contest overall. He is 2-3 and three since joining the UFC out of season six of, or sorry, season five of Dana White's Contender Series. He won his first two fights in the UFC by first-round knockout. Uh, it was a fun story of 2022. Since then, he has dropped three straight, however, to Gregory Rodriguez, Albert Duraev, and Mihal Olegshechuk. The Oleg Shechuk fight, the most recent of those, was a first-round knockout loss at UFC Fight Night Holloway versus Korean Zombie last August. So Njokawani will uh, do his best to keep from going on the first four-fight losing streak of his career. He will have to do it against McKee. 28-year-old Irishman is 13-5-1 and overall. He's 0-3 across two separate stints in the UFC. Uh, he went 0-2 in 2020, was released by the UFC, went back to... UK and Ireland, where he actually won the Cage Warriors welterweight title, then got called back last September, dropped a unanimous decision to Angelosa. So 0-3 overall, still looking for his first UFC win. Uh, he is not favored to get it here, as Njokawani is minus 200, McKee plus 160 on the comeback. Reese McKee is a better fighter than he has looked in his uh, UFC appearances like he, he is he's he's a skilled fighter he's a good fighter and he's a fighter that at 28 uh, even if he gets lamped by Njokawani which spoiler I'm about to pick he he has time he could become a factor at some point down the road but this ain't it because I mean he got thrashed by Hamzat Shemaev in his UFC debut no like there's no no shame to that Tom Dutchamaya is, is a machine. Getting bullied by Alex Morono was not a good look. Like Morono is one of the smaller welterweights in the division, at least for as good as he is. And bullying people around is not his normal game. But I mean, he out wrestled McKee badly, just kind of stifled him. And that was Morono, one of the smaller welterweights in the division. Here he's stepping up to middleweight to take on Chidi and Jokwani, who is a big, big dude. Uh, and I'm Makia is a striker himself, but Njokwani is a bigger striker, a more experienced striker, a much harder striker, probably faster despite the, the size differential. A unless the wear and tear of a now almost 35 fight MMA career and then probably 50 to 100 fight Muay Thai career it is finally going to start showing on Njokwani at age 35. This is a terrible matchup for McKee. Uh, Njokwani, obviously a big 
middleweight. It's hard to believe he ever fought at 170. I, I still think those were pretty much wasted years of his career, but uh, he does try to be an outfighter. He ends up being an all the way out or all the way in fighter. I mean, he's got a good arsenal of kicks and, and really uses his jab at range. Uh, he's also nasty in the clinch with the fighters who, who crash the pocket against him. I just don't think there's going to be much in the way of safe territory for Reese McKee here uh, because McKee at his best kind of tries to employ a, a similar game, just not as effectively. And again, he's going to be smaller, weaker, maybe even slower. Uh, McKee is tough. I, I say he makes it out of the first round. But give me a joke one by second round TKO here, and I, I think it's going to be something nasty. Yeah, this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm okay with McKee moving up because I mean he is a big, long, lengthy guy, so I, I got no issue with that side of it. But again, I, I, you know, need to eat a little bit more this and that, get some mama's cooking. But he, like, that's not going to solve his issues. <laughs> you know, his issues are he's, you know, a terrible, you know, defensive wrestler. He's a terrible defensive striker. Uh, he's not a strong athlete. Well, I mean, he, to his credit, he looked better outside the UFC. Uh, I mean, he's long and lengthy, but at, at, up at middleweight, he won't be as lengthy anymore than he was at welterweight. You know, he's technically sound. He pumps out a jab, which is his best weapon. He's got, you know, tall man's pop, a lot of calf kicks, though often he'll throw them without any setup. He's good from range, but he's a guy that can be, you know, he'll come into a brawl. he will like, fight against his own, uh, you know, game plan. Stands way too tall for my liking. Lacks head movement. Back straight up. I mean, go back to like the Jim Wallhead fight. He didn't like the pressure from Jim Wallhead. He's a weak offensive wrestler and even worse defense wrestler. I mean, he was taken down by Alex Morano three times. Uh, he was taken down by Jim Wallhead despite winning in, in a blowout. Uh, he has three submission wins on his record, which is which is good. He, he's he's a builder that gets strong as the fight goes on. That's a strength of him, and and that might be better as he moves up to middleweight. You know. You know, better cardio, deep fight, like kind of maybe the way he's going to try to win fights. Uh, and and Chidi and Jaguar, I mean, he, it was a nice run that he had in the UFC. Um, surprised a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, this is, I think, what we kind of expect a little bit more of him. Now, he's a, he's a long and lengthy striker. He's got some really long arms and legs. He's he's very good from distance. Nice and relaxed. Switches stances in mid combination. But sometimes he can be a little trigger shy. And he wants to be the one working from the outside. He hates being pressured. I mean, go back to like, uh, Alex Hajak was Hajak was crowding. I mean, we really hated that when he gets in the park pocket, he, he does really well to, you know, look inside and, and look for like knees and slicing elbows. He has serious power. He's, he really always has. He does well in the clinch where he can grind on his opponent, uh, because of how good his striking is. He doesn't get enough credit for his grappling. Like I've always thought he's an underrated grappler. I mean, he's a BJJ black belt. He out grappled Mario Suzon, Dana White's contender series. He almost caught Dusko Chodorovic in an anaconda. But, like, he's still a weak defensive wrestler. <laughs> so I still want to put that out there. Uh, he struggles to get off the bottom. He showed some good ground upon against Mario Souza on, on the contender series. And that's going back a little bit now. But um, a big issue I have with him is he might be a front runner. I mean, he seemed to have mentally broke from the pressure from Michelle Osechek, which is concerning. You know, as far as a Prediction goes, it's not often that Chidi is going to be a better wrestler than someone, but he, he probably is in this case. I don't think it's going to matter, though. I think McKee has too many defensive flaws for me to pick him against a striker against like Chidi. I think Chidi catches him on the feet early. I think he knocks him out. Give me and Joe Kawani by first round TKO. Next up at UFC Atlantic City, it is the Bantamweights as Angel Pacheco debuts against Colin Loughran. Pacheco, the 32 year old Minnesota native is seven and two overall. Uh, he fought on the contender series last September, dropping a unanimous decision to Danny Silva was signed here. Nonetheless to face Lochran. Uh Lochran, 27 year old Irishman is eight and one overall. Uh, he is 0-1 in the UFC since joining as the outgoing Cage Warriors Bantamweight champ. His lone career loss was in his UFC debut last September at uh, UFC Paris, where he dropped a unanimous decision to Taylor Lapalus. Uh, he'll get a second chance at a first win here. He is heavily favored to do so. Lochran, one of the biggest favorites on the card, is minus 325. Pacheco plus 250 on the comeback. 
this seems like it was intentionally put together as a favorable matchup for Colin Lochran to me. Uh, Lochran's at his best when he can box with a guy that wants to box with him. Uh, they had to know, the UFC had to know on some level what was going to happen if they matched him with Taylor Lapalus. Here, Pacheco's probably going to stand and swing with him. And I just think Lochran's better at the same game. Uh, I think he definitely has better power on the off chance. This goes to the ground. I don't think either guy's going to initiate it unless he's badly hurt, but uh, I think Lochran's probably actually more sound on the ground as well. Uh, give me Lochran to win a pretty one-sided decision here and get his first UFC win. Uh, yeah. Um, this, this is an in- intriguing fight. So I- I'll say this. So because of what happened today and, and, and kind of, I'll, you know, give you some behind the scenes. Yeah, I kind of have a set way. You know, we've been doing this long enough. I kind of know how I you got to look into fights. Certain people I'm going to dig deeper in. And obviously, you see newcomers. I'm, I always try to do them first. Lachlan was a guy that I, I was planning on do a little bit more tape study today than, than his last one. At least I watched his last fight. Uh, so I didn't get to do that. So I, you're probably going to get a lot of repeat notes that, I, that I've said about him in his last fight. So I apologize for that. Um, I guess, I guess I could try to say it a little differently. So it seems like, you know, instead of, instead of saying quick hands, I'll say like, you know, uh, fast hands, something, something like that, you know, try to, try to, try to trick the people. Um, so uh, Lachlan, he, he's, he's a short and stocky guy, very physically strong. We see him like he, the guy's not missing chest day. But he's not a great athlete, he, you know. On his feet, like I actually disagree with him. I don't think he's as good, that good of a striker. Um, I think he's. I don't think he's that good of a fighter, to be honest. I'm surprised he's this big a favorite, but uh, he's pretty raw on the feet. He he works on a jab. He likes to get in the pocket. He throws really short, tight, hard hooks. He's got good power. I mean, you look at the guy. The guy. He, I, I wouldn't want to get him out by him, though. He does pull his punches a little bit. He throws a lot of kicks. Uh, but the issue is his defense. I mean, he's a very hittable guy. He lacks head movement. Now, he he wants to wrestle, but I think his wrestling's overrated. I don't think it's that good. Uh, if he gets to fight the ground, he you know, he's you know, he's got pretty good control. He's got two subs on his record. Uh if you try to take him down, he's you know, he's a short, stocky guy. You can have built like a wrestler, so it's gonna be hard to you know get underneath his hips and take him down. Um Pacheco, I mean, it's really hard to get excited for a 32-year-old, you know, UFC debutante. That said, you go back to his last fight. I mean, he was involved in, you know, if he does nothing in the UFC, he was involved in an epic, insane world, probably the best fight in, in contender series history. Uh, and he showed incredible heart. Dude was hurt so many times. He was batted to the body, uh, hurt to the body a couple times, and he just kept coming. Very aggressive, great volume. He's, he's a boxer with really short, tight shots himself. He attacks with big combinations, which I love. I like his straight right. I like that he works the body. My biggest issue with him is because of his boxing background, he plays boxing defense. He tries to fill his shell. He tries to roll with punches. And, you know, I, I know I'm going to sound like a broken record. I've said this a million times. That stuff doesn't really work that well because the big thing about the Philly shell and rolling is having the big punt gloves that you can able to deflect. You can't do that with the small gloves. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, hide to, it's hard to hide behind – you know, a four ounce glove compared to a 12 ounce glove or something. I mean, a lot of times you spar, you spar with a 60 ounce glove. So I, I don't think that's effective. He also backs straight up against the cage, which I don't like, you know, he has like that box inside of the guys who are like, well, like, like to lean against the ropes, have that like protective space. I don't, I don't, I, I'm, I never like that, but you know, some guys do have that. So uh, he, he will go for a takedown, but he's not very good at it. He's a weak defensive wrestler, uh, though. He does have three subs. I'm not high in either guy. Uh, I think Pacheco actually has the advantage of the field. I think he has the boxing advantage. I think he has the output advantage. Laughlin should have the wrestling advantage. If if I'm a betting man, I would bet Pacheco. I, I mean, I think the line should be much closer. I I wonder what kind of war, you know, what kind of what kind of life and damage and and toll that war took on Pacheco. You can't get punched nearly 300 times in a fight. And, and not have some lasting results. Add in that I and, think good. And he's coming back here down a weight class. So you, you wonder if that, like, if he yeah. would have had the ability to take all that punishment, you know, at 135. 
That's a good point. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, add in the fact that Lachlan should be able to close the distance, get the fight to the ground, and win on top. I'm not high on Lachlan. I don't. I don't think he should be a over three to one favorite. But give me Lachlan by decision. Flyweights take the cage next as Victoria Dudakova stakes her undefeated record against Melissa Gatto. Dudakova, the 25-year-old Russian, is a perfect 8-0 as a professional mixed martial artist. She's a perfect 2-0 since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, She fought twice last year, taking a a brief and freakish win over Estela Nunes thanks to an injury in the first you know, minute of the fight, then came back with a unanimous decision over Jin Yu Fry at UFC 294 in October. So she'll look to make it three in a row against Gato. 27-year-old Brazilian is 8-2-2 two and two overall. She's 2-2 two and two in the UFC. She won her first two fights, uh, knocking out Victoria Leonardo and Sayara Eubanks. Uh, since then, she has back-to-back decision losses to Tracy Cortez and Ariane Lipsky. The most recent of those, the Lipsky fight was at uh, UFC on ESPN, Strickland versus Magomedov last July. Odds here, find Gato a moderate favorite. She's minus 170, Dudakova plus 140. Uh, Keith, I'm going to flip this one to you first, but uh, I would probably say off the top of my head that Dudakova is the undefeated fighter in the UFC that I believe in the least. And it looks like the odds makers, or at least the betters who who drive those lines, agree on some level as Dudakova is coming in here as, a, as an underdog. Uh, how do you feel about this one? And how do you think the fight goes? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Mick Parkin might be up there for undefeated fighters that uh, I know that you're not a big fan. I'm a little higher parking than you are, but um, <laughs> heavyweight just doesn't count. That's, yeah. <laughs> fair, enough, fair enough. I'm sure there's, pro- I'm sure there's some pretty obvious undefeated yeah. fighters that we haven't mentioned. Uh, she's got a tough test. I mean, this is, you know, if she wins this one, then I'll stop believing her. A little bit. Gato's good. I mean, Gato, she's, well, I shouldn't say good, but she's you know she's pretty solid. She's she's a long and lengthy fighter. She's big for the weight class. She likes to press the action. She's got quick hands. She attacks with combinations. Good kicking game. I mean, go back to you, Sajara you, Eubanks fights. I mean, she finished her with a body kick. Uh, she uses her size well to kind of bully her opponents in the clinch. Has some good foot sweeps. Uh, solid overall grapple. Some really good back takes. Very aggressive submission artist. Now that, that can be a, a, a flaw for her though, because she'll chase submissions instead of securing the the position first um she's she's good at like chaining sub attacks together which i like she'll go from one sub to another one but the problem is she won't scramble back up to her feet and she'll she'll spend way too much time off her back and she'll lose fights because i'll lose rounds because of that uh due to COVID, i like that she's only 25 like that's that's huge you know she's at that age where you can make huge jumps and improvement she's a you know, big straw weight. She's a good overall athlete. She showed a lot of improvements in her striking in her USA debut, much better than I thought, than I expected from her striking. She still throws, you know, wild shots, a lot of looping shots. She loads up on them. Uh, she throws a lot of hot shots to kind of set up her entries. She will go for takedowns. Not as good a wrestler as I originally thought she was. Like, I thought she was a little bit better wrestler. I expected more, you know, more takedowns and control in her USC debut. But she, you know, she's got a closing distance. She can get to the clinch and, and use her size in there. Uh, she also likes foot sweeps. Good, good top game. She does get to fight to the ground. She has four submission wins herself. And, and what I, what I like, um, well, I like that she's aggressive for subs, but she'll also, you know, rush submissions if they're not there. So we could have some pretty fun scrap, you know, scraps on the ground. Gatto is the more polished fighter, but Dudico is youth has a lot more upside that said i'm i'm gonna go with a vet i mean yeah i mean god is only 28 herself so she's not old or anything but i i like her output on the feet i like her kicks on the feet i think if the fight hits the mat she might be the one on top uh or or she can sweep or she get something and, and she's the biggest submission threat I think this is too much of a step up competition for uh due to cover i say god wins uh, i'll say god wins by decision I, I feel everything that you that you're putting down there. And I like my initial lean was Gatto here. Like I kind of said right off the bat, I just don't believe in Dudakova yet. I 
but there are two factors at work here that the, the escalators might pass in the middle because on the one hand, Dudikov is extremely young, as you're fond of pointing out. She is at the age where with the proper focus and the proper training, the proper camp, uh, a fighter can make enormous strides between fights. And also, you know, this is her third fight in the UFC. It's probably just been a year now that she's really been able to train MMA full, you know, full time. There's every chance that she's going to turn up a better fighter than the one who beat uh, Jin Yu Fry. The other thing is that Gato for a 27 year old is turning into a one fight a year at best fighter. Like she's had some injuries. She's had some long layoffs. She had a weird layoff kind of the second half of 2022 first part of 2023 that I'm, I'm not laying any accusations out there. Like I'm not trying to slander anybody, but it's the kind of unexpected fight withdrawal and then disappearance that sometimes means like a quiet like drug test failure i which you know you always wonder how a fighter will look when they come back from that and sure enough you know she lost to ariani lipsky in her like in her next fight so there's a possibility that gato even though she's only 27 herself has plateaued or even may not be as good a fighter as we saw in her last couple of fights so i'm not a betting man and for the third time in the last five minutes I, i'm not a big believer in dudakova but there there might be some upset potential there but i'm with you i'm i'm still going with gato as the the bigger fighter i mean dudakova is only fighting at 125 because she missed weight you know at 115 in, in her last fight uh gato is going to be bigger she is more polished more of a finished product if dudakova pans out this is a fight that might go very differently two years from now but give me gato by decision as well uh, as well here Next up at UFC on ESPN 54, one of four featherweight fights kind of sprinkled throughout the middle of this card. This one is Dennis Bazookia versus Connor Matthews. Bazookia, the 26 year old New Yorker, is 11 and 4 overall. He is 0 and 2 in the UFC since joining as a two time veteran of the contender series. He lost on season four, won on season six, but was not immediately signed. Uh, went and won three more fights in various regional promotions, then got the uh, short notice call up last summer. He was about the fifth person the UFC tried to get in the cage against Sean Woodson. He was the one that uh, actually was in the cage when the uh, spinning wheel stopped spinning, dropped a unanimous decision. Uh, that was good enough to earn him uh, a return trip. Uh, he fought Jamal Emmers at UFC 295 in November, got knocked out in under a minute. So this will be a third try at his first UFC win. He'll be hoping it. this one's the charm. He'll be taking on a fellow two-time contender series veteran in Matthews. Uh, 31-year-old from Freetown, Massachusetts. Keith, where's Freetown? Do you know? Is it Boston area? Uh, Freetown? Yeah, I'm not really sure. I, I I know he's originally, I think he was originally from Fall River. So, or as as they say in this neck was Fall River, because it's a Portuguese area. Uh, I used <laughs> to live in Fall River. So, um, you know, I don't know. Let me see where Freetown is. It's got to be. It's, uh, maybe it's, maybe it's, it's, I don't think it's near the Cape. It's probably like Boston area. Free time, I says I'm 27 miles away. Oh, it's not far at all, actually. Well, I'll say 45 minutes. Oh, like, oh, okay, like, oh, near Somerset. Oh, actually, yeah, I said, yeah, that's safe. So it's like Fall River touches Somerset, and I knew Somerset, and then Freetown is the next one over. So that's so why they say Fall, Fall River. Fall River is like Fall the big city. All right, so so Fall River was like you, Tom Lawler, and like two hundred thousand Portuguese people. Basically, He's all Portuguese. Uh, Dennis Paiva. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so I grew up in a very Portuguese area. I grew up in East Providence, which is like another very Portuguese area. Believe it, dude, believe it or not, I'm I'm a quarter Portuguese myself. If you saw if you saw my mom, you'd never guess with my mom. She's much darker than me. Like she's, that's awesome. Yeah, I look like my dad. My mom's a my mom's uh family is originally from portugal uh her dad was the only one born here all his he was the youngest all his sisters and brothers were born in portugal that's wild man like yeah because you you do not look uh yeah. any part portuguese but hey no. the genetics are interesting but i've had my i've had my shadis and peppers and all that 
Uh, anyway, Matthews, uh, 31 from, uh, from Freetown. He is seven and one overall. His only career loss came in his first try on the contender series. He fought on season six, dropped a unanimous decision to Francis Marshall, who is now in the UFC. He fought again last October on season seven, took a unanimous decision over Jair Farias to punch his ticket to the octagon where he debuts against Bazookia, and he is a slight underdog. Bazookia is minus 130, Matthews plus 110. Uh, Keith, I call, I, you know, I put you on the spot for it, and this was your peremptory challenge, the, the one fight you'd shave off because, yeah. well, I mean, by definition, it's a fight that could have taken place on the Contender Series or in CES or something. Uh, I'm not even going to ask you if either of these guys is a future top 15 fighter in maybe the hardest division in the sport, but who wins on Saturday? Who, who gets his, who gets a story to tell his grandkids? All right. So, so Ben, I I guess, I guess some fun things to tell you. Uh, All right. So my wife, what she likes to do for Christmas, like the last couple of years, she doesn't buy gifts. She buys like, she, she likes to buy experiences people. So she buys like gift cards to different things. Like, she bought me like going to archery with my son. So we like take the bows out and shoot and go to top golf. That's what she did to, for a lot of the people. Cause I can do top golf here. Uh, <laughs> what she bought me was my gift, but <laughs> it really is her gift. We're going ball. I don't know if it's ballroom dancing, but we're going dancing. We're getting dance lessons tomorrow. Me and my oh. wife. Yeah. So I, I have no idea what kind of dancing. I know that's, that was like my question is like the ballroom. Like, is it like salsa? Is it, you know, swing. I want to, I want to pick her up and like slide her between my legs and shit. <laughs> um, so I, I'm kind of hoping that this will kind of like stop my dancing career and I can kind of fill that void that Michelle Pahea left in Japan when he was a dance instructor <laughs> or, or maybe like M- Michelle Pahea's next, you know, next one, I could be out there dancing with him. Uh, what does that have to do with this fight? Absolutely nothing. I just thought that was more interesting to talk about right now than this, than this fight. Yeah. Well, I'm picturing you and Michelle Pineda on some wild Japanese version of Dancing with the Stars where he's like throwing you up in the air and like, <laughs> I like this. Yeah, I, I, I would, I would try, uh, I would try with, uh, the dirty dancing with uh, with Michelle. Like he he lifts me up and you know, I probably can't jump. I'd have to be the other way around. He'd have to, he'd have to jump. All right. Um. And I, I just thought the listeners would enjoy that that talk more than than, than this one. Like this will be a fun fight. It, like these guys are they're both action guys. So uh, B- Bazooka, he he hasn't looked great so far in the UFC. Had me really questioning if he was UFC level to b- begin with. But in fairness to him, he's faced two really good dudes in, in, in Sean Woodson and Jamal Emers. Uh, he's only twenty six, so I like that. What bothered me is being that he's only 26, he still struggled with the speed of Jamal Emers. That was surprising. Now, he, he's a march forward kind of guy. He likes to bring the action, fights behind a high guard. He, he loves to close distance, battle in the clinch. Um, he'll dirty box. He likes to, he, he can really step into his shots. The problem is he, uh, he loads up so much trying to land like fight ending blow with every shot. His best offense is when he goes down to the body. A lot of defense issues. The biggest thing he doesn't check leg kicks. I mean, Sean Woodson murdered his legs in, in that fight. He's not much of a wrestler. He, like I said earlier, he'll he'll like to grind in the clinch and get it there. But he's a weak defensive wrestler. Sean Woodson was taking him down, and Sean Woodson's not known for his wrestling. Uh, he struggles to get back to his feet. He is tough, and he, and he has good cardio. I'll give you that. But you have to worry about his chin after what you know Jamal Amers battered him. Connor Matthews. He's a long and lengthy guy, southpaw, a pretty good volume. He's a, he's a little bit of a slip and rip guy, uh, plus power. Uh, I give him that. He, that's because he really steps also steps into the shot. Nice kicking game. Uh, I, I like his kicks to the body from the orth, you know when he's going against an orthodox fighter, being from the southpaw stance himself. Uh, he has a wide stance because he has a taekwondo background, so he's got a wider stance, but leaves him open to be calf kicked. Uh, he also keeps his chin too high for my liking. Uh, he will try to get the fight to the ground. He'll catch a kick to get the fight to the ground. But he's also he, – he's not a great wrestler. Like, he's not – I mean, he's, dude, he's from Massachusetts. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, no, nobody yeah, – I, like, I love New England wrestling. I mean, I'm I'm in the New England wrestling scene. I'm here all the time. But uh, I, I don't care. This is going to shock everybody. Red Island has better wrestling than Massachusetts. Like, anyways, uh, that said – He's a he's a very opportunistic wrestler. Like he, he he can time some takedowns. He's a good grappler. He advances his position on the ground. He's got five subs on his record, and he's got cardio to go hard all fight. We saw that in the contender series. 
this is a really hard fight to pick because it's hard to have confidence in either guy. Boston and New York always has had this, you know, rivalry in sports. Uh, I'm I'm sure Bazooka and Matthews will be right up there with Sox versus Yankees for for all time rivalries. <laughs> uh, you know, I like I like how Matthews after his loss, uh, you know, his first loss on the Contender Series, he realized. Oh, well, his only loss in Contender Series, but his first appearance, I should say. He he realized he needed to step on competition because he was fighting some bad dudes. I mean, he fought Jay Ellis. Jay Ellis. Ellis not yep. that not that much before, you know, fighting, uh, you know, contend series. He at least made that adjustment, and, and since then, I think he's fought two or three times, and he's fought better guys. So I must say that pays off. I, I don't take the New England guy often. I think we got a war here. I think, um, but the body kicks and the takedowns of Matthews, I think he's pretty intelligent to win some rounds. I think it's going to be really close, but I think Matthew, these guys are done. Give me Matthew's by split decision. I, I I like the pick there, and I'm kind of leaning your way. Like, obviously, neither of these guys is probably long for the division as anything other than an entertaining fighter. Like, if either of them can alternate wins and losses long enough to stick around, you know, for like a second four-fight contract, I would call that a win for them. Uh, I I like your description of uh, Matthews's ground game because he's quick and opportunistic once it gets there. Like, yeah, he has five subs and four of them are rear naked chokes. And one's, I mean, one's a neck crank that uh, effectively was him going for a a rear naked choke and just (laughs) the guy couldn't even last long enough for him to get it under the chin. Uh, But he didn't really get there on any of them with, what you'd call like a a traditional takedown entry. There are things that just came out of collisions, hurt opponents, uh, grabbing him. Yeah. Like the, the question is whether Bazooki will give him an opportunity to do that. Uh, Bazooki swings really hard and I can just see him like clocking Matthews early and either hurting him real bad or at least just changing the complexion of of the fight to where Matthews doesn't engage. We, we don't see him try to get it to the ground, but I'm picking against that. Uh, Give me the debuting debuting Matthews to, to get the the slight upset here. I'm going to say decision as well, but you know what? If Bazooki gets really sloppy and Matthews gets him in a bad position on the ground and taps him out late, that wouldn't be super shocking either. Uh, so, and so may our uh, unanimous upset picks do better this week than they did last week. Yeah. So, so I remember watching uh, uh, Connor Matthews in person at, at uh, a CES at, at the crowd Plaza and it was on a uh, John Gotti. God. <laughs> yeah. The John Gotti, the third one. Yeah. Yeah. Nick Alley beat John Gotti and like Nick Alley's family was like talking shit to all these like mafia guys, but I was right next to Nick Alley's family and like i made it really known like when i turned over like i, I i'm not with I, 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 I don't know these people like 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 i got a family please but, but I don't, don't bury me with, with jimmy hoffa at least at least let, at least my body be found <laughs> that is <laughs> dying over here yeah oh so my god screw, screw you nick alley's family he almost almost made my wife a widow <laughs> <laughs> Next up, another men's featherweight fight as it is Julio Arce versus Herbert Burns. Arce, the 34-year-old New Yorker, Team Tiger Shulman product should have a good cheering section there. 18 and 6 overall, 5 and 4 since joining the UFC out of season 1 of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh he won his first two fights in the UFC including a win over Danny Ige that is aged extremely well since then he's alternated wins and losses he is coming in off of a loss uh it was actually at bantamweight against montel jackson uh back in november of 2022 at ufc 281 he dropped a unanimous decision uh after just under 18 months off he steps back in here against burns uh who is on a long layoff himself (laughs) 36 year old brazilian by way of south florida 11-4 11-4 and four overall, 2-2 two and two since joining the UFC out of Season 3 of the Contender Series. He won his first two in the UFC, uh, including a win over Nate Landwehr, whom we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, he has dropped two in a row since then uh, to Daniel Pineda and Bill Algio, whom we'll also be talking about in a few minutes. Uh, 
his last appearance, the Aljo fight was a TKO via quitting in the cage uh, at UFC on ABC Ortega versus uh, Rodriguez back in July of 2022 odds here find Arce easily the biggest favorite on the card. He is minus 600 burns plus 400 on the comeback. Oh shit. I get it, man. I I get it because here's the thing. Julio Arce is a fun action fighter. Yeah. Who's well-rounded at 135 or 145. I mean, alternating wins and losses for basically his entire UFC run pretty much encapsulates Julio Arce. He has ended up on some other people's highlight reels. He has made some highlight reels. I mean, I was there when he had kicked Julian Arosa uh, in in San Antonio. That was almost the only fun part of an otherwise absolutely (laughs) horrible card. In in fairness, though, who hasn't head kicked Julian Arosa? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Uh, He got, but then, you know, but he got slaughtered by Song Yudong. Like that, that's who Leo Arce. He's going to win one, lose one, pick up some bonuses. Uh, crowds like him everywhere. Crowd in New Jersey is going to love him. Uh, again, you know, uh, he's a New York guy. He's a Team Tiger Shulman guy. Uh, he should not be a minus 600 favorite against anybody in the UFC, especially at 145. But if there's one guy, it's going to be Herbert Burns. Uh At this point, the book is out on Burns. He is a talented fighter. He's a good striker. He's a great grappler. I mean, he's not Gilbert Burns in terms of his grappling achievements. He's not a three-time world champ. But, you know, he is a a decorated grappler. He's won some regional and some national tournaments in the U.S. He's medaled. Uh, He's a legit black belt. But, one, he has maybe the worst cardio of any fighter of his high level at his lower weight class. Like that's the best way I can put it. Yeah. There are, there are heavyweights. Yeah. Even top 15 heavyweights who have worse cardio, but there's no featherweight that good that has that bad of cardio. And <laughs> you said, you said, take, you said he'd take a long time off. That's because he was still catching his breath. <laughs> Gilbert hadn't put him down yet. Yeah. If, if, <laughs> yeah. if we haven't seen Gilbert, it's because uh, he's still carrying his brother around. Like, just carried like tiny Tim. <laughs> it, was, it was. And the funny thing is, I know their weight classes are different, but Herbert looks bigger than Gilbert. Herbert's like two inches taller, you know, just that's Gilbert's. Like this, yeah. That's the problem. He fights in that weight class and, he, and he's, he's built like Gilbert Burns. Yeah, it completely is. And the problem with Herbert Burns is not just that his cardio is that bad, but it's again, to quote our, our buddy Dev, it's that electric toothbrush cardio. Like once he gets tired, it's over. He, I He literally quit in his last fight. Yeah. I mean, it, it went down as a TKO retirement because he acted like he was hurt, but they were like, dude, if you don't want to fight anymore, you don't have to fight, but it's not a no contest. Like <laughs> this guy, like <laughs> this guy goes on, on the treadmill. He starts getting tired. Instead of like putting the setting down a little below, he, the guy pulls guard on the treadmill. It's <laughs> 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 just, he just, he just butt scoots away from the treadmill. <laughs> That's his cardio. He sits on the edge of it. I, I mean, Julio Arce being a six to one favorite here is, I mean, that looks to me like a tacit acknowledgement on the part of fans and bookmakers that, yeah, Herbert might do well early on, but he won't finish Arce. And if he doesn't finish Arce in the first four minutes, it's our say by whatever he wants. I mean, that's what those odds tell me. And I don't think it's wrong because in the intervening time, Burns has gotten two years older. I mean, he's 36 years old now, even if he were the other kind of featherweight than he is, you would expect him to be on the downslope by now. Uh, he's going to be bigger than our say. He's probably going to be a harder hitter on a shot for shot basis. Uh, he's definitely a more dangerous grappler, even though our is, capable of taking care of himself but burns has three minutes to finish this fight i don't think he does and i think Arce takes over from there uh his last burns last two losses have been instructive because he was all over daniel pineda for a round then second round he he looked a little tired pineda is daniel pineda and just wrecked him in that second round then algio bill algio is another of those billy quarantillo nate land where just the one of those guys that's a terrible matchup for someone like Burns because he's all about toughness and 
you know, outlasting his opponents. Arce is not quite in that mold. Like Arce is a little bit of a caution to the wind uh, offensive fighter himself, but I definitely trust Arce's durability, cardio and heart more than I do Burns, even if Burns has all the physical advantages and most of the skill advantages. Give me Julio Arce by second round TKO here. And I, I think Arce loses the first round. Oh, man. <laughs> the one thing I'll say about Burns is look, there's a lot of guys who fought in, in the UFC who get flushed out. At least he'll always go down as a legend. <laughs> Like, oh, the, the guy fought six minutes and he, he looked like he couldn't walk. I mean, he, he looked like a scene. Gilbert Burns carrying by the kid looked like a scene from Band of Brothers when the guy got his legs blown off. Like, you know? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It, like, the, the, uh, <laughs> he looked like one of those, like the guy who got left in a raft in like the Pacific Ocean for like a month. <laughs> like, when he, when they found him. Like, <laughs> He's 127 hours. He's like sawing his own arm off with like the pocket. Like, oh, the guy couldn't walk down. Think about it. how many steps is it? What's the step stool going from the cage down to the floor? I mean, he couldn't walk. It's down like five back. steps. It's like, yeah, it's like five steps. Holy moly! It would have been even better if they just walked out and let him find his way, find his way out of the cage. He'd still be there. Oh, dude! If his brother was Nick Diaz, Diaz would have just thrown his hands up and walked out. Oh, like you man. know, uh, at least at least the guys are freaking legend. Um, Legendary. I mean, his his striking has been somewhat okay in the past. Like he likes to get in the pocket of and load shots. He he's a brawler. He has some power. Mm -hmm. uh, he loves to throw power kicks because he's he's a guy. He he doesn't care if someone catches his leg. Uh, he, you know, he likes to close the distance, get in the clinch and grind there. He'll he'll look for some body lock takedowns. He's he's got some good entries, or he'll just pull guard. And his BJJ is ex I mean, extremely good. He's a IB, you know, he's a world champion medalist. You know, I shouldn't say world champion. You know, he's the he medaled at the world championship. Yeah, amazing, amazing back takes, smaller than top control. <laughs> the issue is, you said he's the worst gas tank in the history of the UFC. Like he, I said all these things he can do, <laughs> but it's like it's it's two minutes. Uh, he he gassed against Daniel Pineda and got batted for it, but worse, I mean, he gassed against Bill Algio in like two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> his brother is one of the most badass human beings who has ever lived, and this dude <laughs> makes it two minutes. It's oh, well, we uh, had that conversation a couple weeks ago about brothers who uh, were yeah. sisters who fight really differently. This is they it. have the same basic skill sets, but beyond that, they couldn't be much more different. <laughs> Yeah. Um, Julio, I say you mentioned he's so inconsistent. He takes one step forward, one step back. I mean, he is what he is at this point in his career. He he's a southpaw, well-rounded. Uh, he he prefers to strike though. He's he's a good counter striker. Nice jab, beautiful uh, straight left cross. He works the body well. He he's got plus power. Uh, he's 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 good defensively, hard to hit. He likes to slip and rip. Uh, when he has been hit though, there is some signs of decline. I mean, Montel. Jackson dropped him. Song Yadong knocked him out. And fairness, both those losses have aged well, especially the Song Yadong loss. I like his kicking game, really big kicking game. Uh, I love that he adds high kicks into his combination. Great calf kicks, though he doesn't check calf kicks himself. Uh, Hakeem Dawadu, like had a really good time kicking him. He doesn't look to wrestle, but... He, like he didn't look to wrestle often, but he does it enough to win rounds in close fights. Uh, because of his lack of wrestling background, he does need to improve his own takedown defense. He has a submission threat. He has five subs. I mean, he he could get sub burns if Burns like gets so gassy, just taps the mat. Uh, I'm surprised Burns is still fighting. Like I, I thought he retired. You know, uh, after his yeah. last performance, I expected him just to be you know compete in BJJ or. If we ever saw him in the UFC again, being like someone's corner as a BJJ coach, this I wouldn't bet on this. You know, I wouldn't bet on Arce because the submission threat is always there. Like he, he could find a way to get to fight the ground and catch something because he's you know that decorated. He might even get Arce down, and I agree with you. Like I think he could win the first round, but I think Arce weathers the storm and he just takes over and he batters him and finishes him and. 
I, I think he finished him with a body shot. I don't think it gets a second. I think Arsene's going to finish him first. Say late first round, uh, TKO, I'll go with a body shot. Next up, another featherweight matchup. This one featuring Bill Algio and Kyle Nelson. Aljo, the 34-year-old from, hey, State College, Pennsylvania, the current epicenter of collegiate wrestling, halfway between Pittsburgh and Philly. Uh, he's 18-7 and seven overall. He's 5-3 and three since joining the UFC. As a veteran of Season 3 of Dana White's Contender Series, uh, he lost on the Contender Series, but he did survive since the guy he was fighting wasn't a killer. Uh, he was signed shortly thereafter anyway, and since then, 4-3 and three in the big octagon. He's on a two-fight win streak. Uh, he fought twice last year. Uh, tapping out T.J. Brown in April and winning a unanimous decision over Alexander Hernandez in October. So he'll look for his first three-fight win streak in the UFC at the expense of Nelson, uh, who will be doing the same. 32-year-old Canadian is 15-5-1 overall. He's 3-4-1 in the UFC. Uh, he's on a two-fight win streak of his own. Uh, he fought three times last year, had a draw with Duho Choi in February, took a unanimous decision over Blake Builder in June, and then in a win that uh, has aged well for him, took a unanimous decision over Fernando Padilla at Noche UFC in September. Uh, so he also will be looking to make it three in a row. He's not favored to do so. Aljo is minus 230, Nelson plus 190 on the comeback. Keith, uh, these are two more guys that are just that batch at 145. I mean, it's we talk about how deep divisions like 135, 145, 155, even 170 are. And it's not about how good the top 10 are. The top 10 are great in every division, except for like women's van and weight and men's heavyweight. The crazy thing about 135 and 145 is how good the like 15 through 25 guys are. They're just tough, well-rounded fighters who do everything at least decently. And a lot of them do at least one thing pretty damn well. Aljo and Nelson are just two more of them, man. And uh, uh, again, it's 145. I'm not picking either guy to be a future top 15 guy. There's just, I mean, neither of these guys is going to win six in a row, and that's what it's going to take. But uh, they're both a whole hell of a lot of fun to have around for as long as we have them. Uh, who you got in this one, and how do you think the fight uh, plays out? Uh, this, this is this is a uh, intriguing fight. I mean, like, I agree. I think both guys are pretty solid fighters. Um, Algio, he's he's a long and lengthy striker. Uh, he's a controlled pressure striker, a uh, bit of a builder that gets stronger as the time goes on. A lot of volume. I've said it before. He kind of fights like Stephen Thompson, where he's got, keeps his hands low and, and he counters from weird angles. Throws a lot of looping punches. Throws a lot of con yeah. I shouldn't say looping, but like you know from weird angles. Uh, throws a lot of combinations. Uh, I love that he throws kicks in his combinations. Underrated power. Um, incredible kicking game. Uh, he loves to close the distance. The distance with like a flying knee. Strong plum clinch because uh, of his size. Gets in the end, lands a lot of knees inside. I think he's actually he's an underrated offensive wrestler. He'll sneak in the takedown or two. He also looks uh, by locks inside. It's the water. Right it's the water in State College. Like it, anybody who just drinks the water there for a year just becomes a good wrestler. Yeah, is he? Is he from that? Far? I mean, I, is he that close? I thought so. I thought he's like. Um, um, he, he runs a gym in Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. That's but he himself is from State College, which is almost oh, yeah. exactly oh, okay. halfway okay. in between. But like, I mean, that's the next state up from where I yeah, grew right. up. So I have a decent feel for Pennsylvania geography. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Like, I'm actually going to uh, Pennsylvania in a couple weeks for a training. So, oh, awesome, uh, man. And uh, right where, where is it? Um, Valley Forge area. Oh, that's beautiful country, man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. I'm. I'm going up. Like it's a Monday to Thursday, so I'll have. I'll be up there. Like, I'm going, where is it? is it? Is it at a college? Uh, it, it is. Um, I, I have to look. It's a. It's a. The training I'll be at for a week, and I'm oh. being all by myself. Like I'm, got to be there and get, get the get the company card and get, eat, eat eat good. Check out. Uh, I was gonna check out Valley Forge. Check out. You know, see see, see what they're doing up there, and and I don't know. <laughs> they, they, they 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 were gonna put me in a casino, <laughs> like there was like a like a hotel in a casino, and I was like, oh, that sounds cool, and and they gave me a couple other spots to pick from. I picked a I picked a nice hotel. I'm like, eh, I don't know, I don't know. yeah, like going downstairs at the casino would probably be fun one night, but the rest of the days, eh. 
that's not my scene. So I shouldn't, I probably shouldn't do that. There you go. <laughs> I come back with my wife's like, Hey, how's the training? Like, I don't, I don't know. I never went. I was, I was on, I was on a heater, honey. Hey, <laughs> Keith, Keith, where's your wedding ring? <laughs> can't, we'll get it back, baby. We'll get honey, it back. You know, honey, you know the rule. You can't leave the table when you're on a heater. <laughs> um, so back to, back to Algeo. Uh, uh, he, he likes to take gambles himself. He'll, like, he'll close the distance with a flying knee. Uh, he, Ooh, great segue. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. He, he looks to get inside. Um, he'll, he, dude, you know what? He really will take you. He'll, he'll, he's a guy that'll go for a headlock, which I hate, but hey, sometimes, sometimes you gotta, you know, gotta put it all in on the table. Uh, he's the problem is he's a weak defensive wrestler. He doesn't stop many takedowns. He also like, he, he doesn't sprawl. He'll look for Kamoras and jump guillotines and stuff like that. He is a BJJ black belt. He, he can sub attacks together well uh, off, off his back or, or use it to kind of scramble. Uh, he, he he showed some solid sub defense in the, in the two minutes that he was taken down by Gilbert Burns. Uh, Move on to Kyle Nelson. I, I feel like he kind of, we know what we got Nelson at this point. He's, he's a wrestle boxer. I've liked what he's done. He's really like he's gassed out in the past, so he's really slowed the pace, and he's had this ability to trick his opponents to kind of fight at his pace, very Andre Arlovski like. Uh, he's got some tight inside boxing, works behind a jab, nice straight right. He gets to the pocket and he kind of, uh, you know, whips an overhand. I'd say he's got some pretty, you know, plus power. Works the body. Uh, calf kicks are, are really good, though he'll often throw them naked. He closes the distance and, and battles in close quarters. He likes that like chest to chest grind. Uh, he will wrestle, and he wrestle a lot. Uh, if you know, when he closes this distance, he has four submission wins. The, his cardio has been an issue in the past, but he's done a really good job of controlling it. I think this is a really tough fight to pick. Aljo is the is the way better athlete. He should have the volume advantage. You know, does he get sucked into Nelson's voodoo and slow down? I actually don't think so because the way Aljo fights, that's not not him. Um, the bigger issue is can he stop takedowns? I don't think he can. But I think he creates enough space, enough scrambles to give himself opportunities to get back up and pick up the pace in the second and third. And I think he takes I think he wins those rounds. I think it's gonna be back and forth fun fight. I think Aljo's gonna win by decision. I I like the breakdown there and don't really have much to add to it. I would have felt I would have felt really strongly in favor of Algio even just a year ago, but you're right in that Nelson has figured out a way to manage his cardio problems. I like, I don't know that they're solved. I have no idea if he like does more cardio in the gym or anything, but he's, he's gotten better at imposing his pace on fights. Uh, because <laughs> he, he, he can't control Herman Burns just laying on the treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm, 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 I'm gonna set you go, buddy. No, oh, okay. <laughs> that if that becomes a recurring thing for us, I am so here for it. Uh, but you know, up to a year ago, that was Nelson's most obvious problem. Uh, and Algio was just built to take advantage of that. You look at some of the people he's built, beaten, you know, Spike Carlisle, Herbert Burns, Alexander Hernandez, guys that you know he had to outlast. Um, I still feel that way, just not as strongly. If I were a betting man, I'd be nervous taking him at greater, uh, almost two and a half to one. But I feel like he gets it done here by decision as well. Um, be interesting to see if he circumvents the whole defensive wrestling thing by choosing to take to try and take Nelson down. Because if Aljo lands on top, he's proven that he's a good, stable top position grappler who can stay busy enough not to get stood up, who can inflict some damage on top, can keep his opponent on the defensive. That would be an interesting look. But uh, either way, I, I think Aljo gets it done by decision as well. Men's featherweights take the cage once again as Nate Landwehr squares off against Jamal Emmers. Landwehr, the 35-year-old Tennessee native, is 17-5 and five overall. He is 4-3 and three since joining the UFC as uh, a former M1 featherweight champ. It's kind of wild that we have two former M1 champs on this card and neither of them is Russian. Anyway, yeah. uh, <laughs> Landwehr, he, he is coming off a loss. He dropped a unanimous decision to uh, Dan Ige back in June at UFC 289. Prior to that, he'd been on a three-fight win streak over Ludovic Klein, David Onama, and Austin Lingo. So he's looking to get back in the win column here. He will have to get past Emmers to do it. Uh, Emmers, 34-year-old from California, is 20-7 and seven overall. He's an even 3-3 three and three in the UFC. He is 
alternated wins and losses literally for all six of his UFC fights. He's coming in off a win. Uh, as we alluded to earlier, he blasted Dennis Pazukia at UFC 295 in 49 seconds, uh, just completely buried him in punches in under a minute. So uh, he'll be looking to break that pattern of alternating wins and losses. He is favored to do so. Emerus, minus 200, Lamware plus 165 on the comeback. <sighs> Emmers. <laughs> I mean, it's tempting to make the comparison because he is Bobby Green's primary training partner, just to call him featherweight Bobby Green. And there, I mean, there are certain uh, similarities, you know, both boxers who like to slip and rip, who sometimes think that slipping and ripping uh, by itself is enough to win rounds, underrated, underused wrestling. Like there, there are certain, uh, you know, certain parallels, but uh like I, I don't think Embers had the same overall upside that Green did, but Embers, he's got some fast hands, good power, throws nice straight punches. When he's when we get good Jamal Embers, he throws in combination. It's rarely just one punch. Uh, really, like he has so many advantages o- over over Landwehr, but he should be much faster on on the feet. Like he should be able to to bust Landwehr up with his jab and and his one two. He should be able to fight off uh, takedown attempts for, uh, from Landwehr. Like he, sh- he should be able to just use his better foot uh, work, use his better head movement to stay away from Landwehr's rushes on the feet. Because Landwehr throws good volume on the feet. He's very aggressive, but you know he just kind of comes forward and swings. Emmer should be able to make him look amateurish. He should be able to just either pancake takedown attempts or just flat out not be there uh, when, when Landwehr shoots. But... I just worry that we'll have a defensive lapse that lets Landwehr, you know, get into the ground with plenty of time to work in a round or catch him with a, a big punch and hurt him. If Emmer slows at all late in the fight, Landwehr tends to uh, pick up steam as he goes along. I, I like Emmer's in this fight. I like him to win a decision, but I'm, I'm not going to feel comfortable with that pick until the, the final uh, horn sounds. Uh, give me Emmers by decision, but it is with a certain amount of trepidation. Yeah, this is um, <laughs> this is a tricky fight. Landwehr, you know, he's fun. He's a fun guy. Like he, he's a fun yeah. fighter. His personality is fun. Like he's he's a guy. He's gonna bring the action. He's just mark forward striker, nonstop output. Dude will drain every single ounce of energy he has, you know, to win a fight. But because of that, he can be very reckless and hit a lot. I mean, the guy was squaring up so much when he was swinging for the fences against Darren Elkins. Uh, he's, you know, when he slows everything down, he's got a nice jab, uh, really good kicking game, tons of kicks. I like his teep kicks. He's got a fast high kick, good calf kick. Uh, he'll close the distance and just grind in the clinch. Not the best offensive wrestler, but he, he finds ways to get the fight to the ground. Uh, he showed good takedown defense against Darren Elkins. Good get up game if he is taken down. He just, like I said, he just got to keep going. Um, and good sub defense when he's taken down. Emmers, Emmers looks sensational against Dennis Pazuka, but I mean, take that for what it's worth. He's a really big guy for the weight class. Um, he's always surprised me that he's he's a featherweight. Like you mentioned, Jamal Emmers, I just, I just think of like a like a welterweight. <laughs> he just seems like he should be. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's got you know high volume himself, fast hands, pretty accurate. He's long and lengthy. He can work really good from distance. Nice jab. Uh, I love his straight right. I like that he works the body, big kicking game, uh, especially to the body. Nice step in knees. He's got like suddenly he's got all this power recently. I mean, he, he might be getting this like old man strength, which which I love. He he does avoid strikes by back and straight up, which I hate. Um, that's something that will not work well against Landwehr if he if he can't handle the pressure of Landwehr. Um, he uses his size really well in the clinch, where he can kind of grind and wear on his opponents to like lean on them. Uh, he uses his frame to blast knees to the body. He's a solid wrestler, good at chain and takedowns together, good at winning scrambles. Uh, he controlled Jack Johnson from the top, uh, although he was kind of stalling. That's a fight that some people thought he should have won. Uh, he's a submission threat. Lamar is a tough out for anybody due to his pressure and and his volume. And I that said, I think Emmers is still better everywhere technically. Uh, so you know, you kind of. Alluding to that, and, and I'm I'm doubling down with you. 
I think he can land some big shots. I think he can dominate on the ground too. Lambert is tough to beat because he won't stop. I expect him to have a late surge. I just think Emmers will survive. Give me Emmers by decision. Next up at UFC Atlantic City, the card is still in a certain amount of flux, but there's a decent chance that this is your main card opener. It is a 185-pound scrap between Andre Petrosky and Jacob Malkoon. Petrosky, the 32-year-old Pennsylvanian, is 10-2 and two overall. He is 5-1 and one since joining the UFC as a, a veteran of Season 29 of The Ultimate Fighter. He won his first five official fights in the UFC, uh, a fantastic streak that only came to an end last October at the hands of Michelle Pereira. Uh, he got knocked out in just a minute and six seconds. So Petrosky will look to embark on another win streak here, prove that he is, in fact, a future contender in the UFC middleweight division. He will have to get past Malcoon to do it. Malcoon, 28-year-old Australian, is 7-3. and three. Overall, he's an even three and three in the UFC. He is coming in off a loss, uh, a bit of a strange one. He fought just once last year. It was in September at Fight Night Fazee versus Gamrot, where he got disqualified for an illegal elbow strike on Cody Brundage late in the first round. Uh, so make of that what you will. It was definitely a, a weird fight, but he's back in the cage six or seven months later, and uh, he is a favorite. Malcoon minus 200, Petrosky plus 165. Wow. Keith, yeah, I, I, I said wow as well without tipping, you know, who I'm picking. I, I was surprised to see that that was the line. I would have expected it to be basically the opposite. Uh, tell me who you got in this one and how between two guys that are arguably uh, both overachieving already compared to their initial expectations in the UFC. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, this is a good one. Um, I'm, I'm intrigued. Petrosky, so he's he's a southpaw, but he like he's one of these guys. He switches stances a lot. He he's a boxer. He's a, you know he's very tight inside striking. He's got a lot of power. I mean, just look, look at the guy. The guy's freaking. He, he just like you would think of uh, like a frat house. If you like making a frat movie, you just need like UFC guys. Like like what he, he should have been an extra in Roadhouse. I, I haven't watched the movie, but I'm assuming it's like that feel. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, He's 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 a very he's an extremely hittable guy, which is which is concerning. He doesn't move his head. Uh, I mean, Brian Battle had success on on the Ultimate Fight Show. Uh, Young Zong Hu had, had moments. Gerald Mershot had a lot of success on the feet against him. He's a very good wrestler, but that said, I think it's a slightly overrated. Uh, it's still good. Don't get me wrong. He can blast you double. He can get to the second level. Uh, he's he's good at grabbing a single leg, running the pipe. Uh, he can be relentless in times getting the takedowns, but it's, it's still I don't know. I just he's he's he struggles taking down some guys that that he shouldn't struggle taking down. Uh, he he does a lot of big moves, which kind of can sap his energy. Uh, if he gets the fight to the ground, he's he's got good top control. Uh, he advances position. He loves like head, you know, classic wrestling headlocks, like a head and arm choke. He loves head attacks. He caught Nick Maximoff in the anaconda choke. Being a wrestler, he's very uncomfortable off his back. Uh, he gave us back against Brian Battle. He was subbed by Brian Battle. Cardio is a question mark. I always thought he had bad cardio, but then I just realized he slows down and he and he's one of these guys. He he looks more tired than he is. And but he still goes hard. Like he's had fun. I mean, you go like the Jeremy Mershaws. He was still fighting hard in the fifteen. He just his his optics look bad. <laughs> you know, he looked like he was screwing time, but he still kept moving forward. Um, I'm I'm more concerned about his chin though. You know, he just got knocked out by Michelle Pereira. I'm also worried about like how gun shy he's going to be. He's a guy that needs to get in the pocket to kind of set up his entries after coming off a knockout. Uh, how's that going to be? Jacob Malkoon, He he's a volume striker. Uh, he uses. Cardio is a tool. That's his thing. He marches forward, attacking with combinations. His hands are are. I've said this before. He's his hands are faster than I thought. Uh, when he first came to UFC, I, I didn't expect him to be in the UFC long, and he's really exceeded expectations. And he looks way better than than I thought he was going to be. He's got a good jab. He can look for his overhand right a little bit too much. Uh, it can be a little predictable with that though. Uh, he has surprising power. He he constantly attacking on the street. You know. He keeps attacking on the straight line, which is which is concerning. He's going to walk into a big power shot. Doesn't really cut angles much. He's not had that much of a kicking game, but he makes up for all his lack of 
technical skills, but just being a super high IQ fighter. He's good at getting opportunistic takedowns. He's good at knowing what his game plan is. His game plan is to force his opponent to his back foot so they can't stop takedown attempts when he shoots in. He's he's a good wrestler. Uh, he can shoot. You know, he can shoot a time without a setup, which is concerning. He, he, I've seen him get sprawled out on, but he's so mentally strong that like he's relentless to get that f- fight to the ground. He'll close the distance. He'll grind. He loves snatch singles. He got a bunch of takedowns against uh, Razak Al-Hassan, against AJ Dobson. And they took down Brandon Allen. A lot of people thought he should have got a win over Brandon Allen. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, strong, strong top game. Uh, he smothered AJ Dobson on the ground. Uh, the reason why I said I was surprised, like I kind of was surprised by the betting line that Malcoon was like a two to one favorite. I'm not. I wasn't surprised that he was the favorite. I just, Petrovsky looks like he should win on paper. He's the way better athlete. He's the way you know more decorated wrestler. Uh, he's the guy that came in you know off the Ultimate Fighter show. He was the guy that should have you know people thought was going to win that season. He, he's the guy that. Came in, it looked like he, oh, he could be a, a contender one day. While well, Malcoon was the guy that he was just going to be card filler, like happened to get in. You know, all you, at that time, Robert Whitaker was a champion, and we kind of like dogged him, like, oh, he's Robert Whitaker's friend. So he got like a, you know, got in like the uh, six flags, like sp- speed pass lane, you know. <laughs> but so everything says that Petrowski should win on paper, but it's not going to happen. Like I'm, I'm pretty confident in, in Malcoon. All the intangibles favors Malcoon. Malcoon is a builder, and his pressure is. I think he's just gonna suck the life out of Petrowski. I think he pieces up Petrowski on the feet when Petrowski starts to slow down, and his Malcoon actually gets the takedowns. I think he's gonna surprise Petrowski. I think Petrowski gonna be breathing hard. I think the pressure starts to break Petrowski. I actually think Malcoon's gonna get a stoppage late. I can see, I can see like Petrowski being on his back, not feeling comfortable, maybe giving him his back, getting grounded, pounded, or, or maybe giving up a rear naked choke. Give me, give me Malcolm by third round, uh, TKO by from grounded pound. I I like the breakdown there, and <clears throat> these are both fighters that I've had to kind of come around on. Uh, Malcolm, for the same reason as you, he looks like somebody that, you know. He's a big dude, but he doesn't look like a freaking great athlete. No, he, he doesn't look like a great athlete. And it's just it was tempting to see him as the guy that Robert Whitaker kind of like lifted the rope and like snuck him into the club uh, <laughs> through the back door. And that was borne out when Phil Haas blew him yeah. out of his sneakers in like 15 seconds. Do we, do we, I don't know if we talked about we talk, I think we talked about Do you ever watch Entourage? I mean, not in years and years. Uh, well, he's, he's like when he showed up, he was like turtle. He was like turtle. With okay. Like he was turtle. And- <laughs> You know, Rob Waker was like the movie star guy. Yeah, and and you know, Malcoon visibly undersized for 185. A, another parallel with Whitaker, a much better wrestler than you would expect. Another parallel with Whitaker, but I agree. Like the brains and the heart are what have really carried him. And thus far, who's he lost to in the UFC? He got not again. He got blown away by Phil Hawes. That's just yeah. a guy that had never fought even a decent fighter merging into freeway traffic on his bike. But then Brendan Allen in a super close fight and Cody Brundage by a dumb disqualification in a fight where he was otherwise tooling Brundage. Like yeah. he was, I mean, I don't know if it was a 10, eight round in the making, but at the very least Malcolm was dominating yeah. that fight. It, it, like, it felt like a John Jones, Matt Hamill situation. I, I agreed. And when I say a, a dumb disqualification, I mean, Malcoon did a dumb thing. Like he absolutely broke the rule, but oh, absolutely. Yeah. But you know, they fight 10 times. It plays out like that once. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Petrosky. It's interesting to draw uh, parallels between him and his uh, teammate, Sean Brady, who I imagine is one of his primary training partners, uh, both. I mean, they are very, they're both very good wrestlers, but I agree that they might not be as lights out as we're led to believe. And the main problem is that both of them have a wrestling style that puts a lot of stress on them, like just very muscle heavy, exertion heavy. It's not the kind of wrestling where you know your opponent's getting tired faster than you. And it's told on Sean Brady already. It's, I mean, it's going to tell on Petrosky eventually. And with that kind of a known flaw, it is tough to pick him against Malcoon because I could I could see him doing well early on. Uh, he hits hard. Malcoon is hittable. 
uh, like if it just turns into a wild, let's win a bonus brawl in the first round, Petrosky's probably going to get the better of it. I believe Petrosky can probably take Malkoon down at least early, but yeah. He manages his cardio, but it's still an issue. I agree that the optics are worse. Like, I mean, he's won numerous fights that went into the third round. He, well, he won at least one fight in the third round because he gets tired like Derek Lewis or Yolo Romero. Like the, the, the volume goes down. He's breathing with his mouth open. Like you can tell he is tired, but he's never completely out of it. And he is still looking for moments for offense, but yeah, that dynamic favors Malcoon. I'm with you. I'm going to say Malcoon doesn't get the finish, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if you're right there either. Give me Malcoon by winning the second and third rounds. And, uh, you know, he wins this going away where he's, he's pulling further away as the fight goes along. Next up at UFC on ESPN 54 is a strawweight clash between Verna Janjiroba and Lupi Godinez. Janjiroba, the 35-year-old Brazilian, is 19-3 and overall. She's 5-3 and since joining the UFC uh, as the outgoing Invicta strawweight champ. She's on a two-fight win streak. Uh, she took a unanimous decision over Angela Hill just a little under two years ago uh, at UFC on ESPN, Blahovich versus Rakic. Came back uh, last May at UFC 288 and took a unanimous decision over Marina Rodriguez. She'll look to make it three in a row and kind of remind the UFC strawweight division that she is in fact a, a factor and a contender. She will have to get past Godinez to do so. 30 year old Mexican by way of Canada is 12 and three overall. She's eight and three in the UFC. She's on a four fight win streak, uh, fought four times last year, beating Cynthia Calvillo, Emily Ducote, Elise Reed and Tabitha Ricci. The most recent of those, the Ricci win was at UFC 295 in November. Godinez will look to make it five in a row and confirm herself. Uh, somebody kind of elbowing her way to the front of the line in title contention at 115. She is favored to do so. She's minus 190, Janjiroba plus 160. Uh, I like Verna Janjiroba. I It's taken me a while to realize that, uh, you know, going all the way back to her Invicta days, but it's it's admirable that she's managed to carve out as much success as she has the way that she has because she's not a big straw weight like she's she's not tall nope. she's she has muscle on her frame but it's not a big frame it, it, she's not Jessica Andraj when, when you look at her <laughs> uh, she's a relatively small straw weight who has managed to be a bullyish wrestler and top position grappler because mm -hmm. her grappling, I mean, she's, she's a black belt in jujitsu. She has a shitload of submissions, but it's very old school. Like, especially at straw weight, you know, a lot of your grapplers, it's pretty scrambly. A, a lot of women have gotten good success off of, you know, like, offense from their back. Like look at people like, like Jillian Robertson, JJ Robo is not that she is like a little female, Rafael Dos Anjos or yeah, that's the exact person I was thinking of. Yeah. Or I mean, even you think of Minotaro Noguera, like his, his biggest highlights, you think of him doing stuff from his back. Cause he always had people like Fedor and Tim Sylvia and stuff on top of him. But when he, when he was on top, just very methodical. Oh yeah. Uh, top position grappler, ultra solid position first, then damage, then break you down and get an arm bar. That like yeah that that's the style of grappler Janjiroba is and it's impressive that she's made that work, uh, in Invicta against some good fighters and then in the UFC against some of the best the division has to offer. Uh, I just I just think that's cool you know as someone who's been watching the sport as long as we have, the seeing old school specialists still thriving in twenty twenty four yeah you know I, I have a special place in my heart for those types. It is concerning to me. The, um, she's 35. She's turning into a once a year fighter. She had a major knee surgery uh, about a year and a half ago, which accounted for the layoff between the Hill and Rodriguez fights. So there's every possibility that the Janjiroba that we see in the cage on Saturday is diminished somehow from the one that we've seen. And if she, I, I, if she is diminished, this style is going to stop working pretty quickly because even as it is, she's like dominating certain fighters, but it just in a game of inches, like, you know, like she, she's getting the takedown she's getting and she's getting the top control she's getting. Uh, 
but if she slows down just a tick, if that surgery, if the age, if all the, the fights have taken anything off of her, it's, it's going to, it's going to get ugly quick. Uh, her striking is, I mean, it's not bad, but it's never been more than serviceable. And it's always been kind of a, a means to an end for her anyway. You know, she sets up like a Muay Thai striker. Uh, she, I think she actually does good work in the clinch, especially considering she's shorter than a lot of her uh, opponents. But even there, once she's in the clinch, she wants to throw a couple strikes and try to find a way to get the fight to the ground. Uh, against Godinez, she's going to be taking on someone who's probably going to be shorter than her you know, for one of the rare times in her UFC career. But Godinez is one of the two or three best wrestlers in the division. Uh, she's a hell of an athlete. Uh, she's one of the few fighters in the division that is like, and this is not meant to sound insulting or dismissive at all, but a wrestler wrestler, not a, a girl wrestler. Just, yeah. I mean, that's, that's just the easiest way to put it. Like, she yeah, hit like a she, duck under to fight. She hit a duck under. She shoots single and double legs like a man who wrestled in college. Like, it, that's, that's she's short and cocky. She's built like Dayton Fix. <laughs> She might be the, the the actual same height for all we know. Like, uh, <laughs> she, which is, I mean, that's remarkable. That's uh, it's rare in any female fighter. Just again, because opportunities to wrestle at the high school and college level have been much slower in coming, and it's frankly rare in any Mexican fighter. Period, male or female. Uh, it's just, I'm I'm going out on a bit of a limb here, but I think Jan Jadrova can win this one. I. I think Godinez could probably get Jan Jodobo down, but I wonder if she's going to try to embrace more of a sprawl and brawl fight here rather than take this into Jan Jodobo's world at all. Because I could see her taking Jan Jodobo down and getting swept. Uh, we don't get to see much of Jan Jodobo from her back. Like, usually she's the one bringing the fight to the ground. But I wonder if Godinez is going to try to, you know, stick and move, sprawl, avoid the clinch, uh, again, because she's not the type of fighter who, who needs the clinch for her striking or for her wrestling. But either way, I I see Jan Jadoba finding a way to win two rounds here. Like, either sneaking out two rounds of hard-to-score stuff on the feet or actually getting takedowns on Godinez and showing us, like, parts of Godinez's game that we haven't really had to see yet. Uh, give me Jan Jadoba in the upset here. Uh, I could look really silly if Janjaroba looks slow, if she looks old, but uh, give me Janjaroba to snap the five fight win streak of Lupi Godinez here and catapult herself, you know, kind of take all that momentum from Godinez and catapult herself into the outer reaches of the title picture here uh, with the win, her third in a row. Janjaroba by a decision. Um, yeah, this is. Um... This is a good one, man. I, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, how Godinez does in a step up in competition. Say what you want about Vernon Janarova. If you beat Vernon Janarova, you're, you're a really good fighter because the next tier down doesn't beat her. I mean, she's, she's, the one, one issue about Vernon Janarova is she never seemed to improve her striking. Her, it, I mean, it's ugly. Her technique is bad. She throws single strikes. Uh, she loads up and telegraphs makes her very predictable. She has no power. Uh, I mean, it, it was go back to like the one time she dropped Amanda Hibas, but I with one strike, and I, I still think that was just like Habib landing that shot on and Connor, where it's more they worried about the takedown and he just landed perfectly. I I love that you said that she's like an old school grappler from the early days. That that's her style. Like she's a one dimensional fighter that she wants to get the fight to the ground. She's got a control. She's got good entries. Her I think her wrestling is very solid. Very good at grappling, good at turning the corner when she gets on the hips. Um, you know, she understands leverage and everything right. She's got good control, doesn't rush the position, like you said, works inch for inch before locking the submission. And she obviously is a really good submission threat. That's her game. And she she has no problem with taking down and holding you against the cage and, and wearing you there and, and getting booed and that she doesn't care. Uh Lupi Goodness, she's a wrestle boxer, high output well. I shouldn't say high about she she's ha she can be, but there's times that she's you know go back to the Tabitha Ricci fight like she won that fight, but she was not matching Tabitha Ricci's volume on the feet, which is a problem. Her boxing has really improved. She does well to cut off the cage, kind of trap her opponents, 
works in the pocket. She's got quick hands. She's got nice tight shots. Uh, I love her overhand right. She has a lot of good pop. She really steps into her shots. You talked about her wrestling. Her wrestling's off the charts for female MMA. Uh, I mean, when, but the problem is she she's one of these wrestlers who's fallen in love with her hands at times and and will abandon her wrestling. I mean, she she gave away the fight against. I always say that she Angela Hill was a perfect stylistic matchup for her, and she decided to not wrestle Angela Hill and gave away the fight. And Cynthia Cavio was like the second best stylistic matchup, and she almost did the same exact thing against Cynthia Cavio by just like going exchange for exchange instead of getting some entries of winning. But she's got good technique and she's got explosions. She's a really good fighter when she doesn't get her own way. Uh, she's got good entries. She's very physically strong. She grabs a limb. Her opponents are going flying. Uh, she, she can get in the hips and slam. I mean, she threw Jessica Penne, Silvio uh, Gomez Suarez, Loma Labumi, which is, a, I think, is an underrated grappler herself, Elise Reed. I mean, look what she did to uh, Ariana Carnalisa. I mean, she was turning her into a takedown dummy. Um, she's got strong takedown defense. She's she's also a top side grappler. One of those ones, she follows the hips so well if you try to scramble. Some showed her some slick BJJ with her belly down on bar against Suarez and, and the rear naked choke against Elise Reed. Um, if Godinez d- throws like looping shots trying to end the fight, overextends, I definitely could see Janaroba get a takedown. If Godinez backs up towards the cage, doesn't like some pressure from for Janaroba, uh, you know, Janaroba can get it, get her down. And and hold her down and and you know take a wrestle put her on her back that that could be an issue. Problem is I don't think she can get her down. I I think I think uh, Godinez batters her on the feet. I you said that you know this could be a sprawl and roll. I think that's exactly what's gonna happen. I am worried about her lack of output. I think that could cost her from getting a stoppage. Uh, you know if she tends to cruise. So I'll say Godinez by decision. We head now to the middleweight division for a matchup between Nursultan Ruzaboyev and Sadriqus Dumas. Ruzaboyev, the 30-year-old Uzbekistani, is 33-8-2 with two no contests overall. He is 1-0 in the UFC. He debuted last July, knocking out Bruno Ferreira in a minute and 17 seconds. Uh, he steps back in, looking for his uh, second win in a row in the UFC, his 10th in a row overall against Dumas. 28-year-old Florida native is 9-1 and one overall. He's 2-1 and one since joining the UFC out of Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. Uh, he lost his UFC debut to Josh Fremd via second-round submission. Since then, he has back-to-back uh, decision wins over Cody Brundage and Abu Azetar. He will look for his third win in a row here. Uh, he is not favored to get it done. Ruzaboyev, one of the bigger favorites on the card at minus 280. Dumas plus 220. Obviously, the record that's concerning in the case of Dumas is not his fight record, but his criminal record. Uh, this fight yeah. has been scheduled for several months. Dumas got arrested uh, again. <laughs> out, uh, again, got arrested for uh, disturbing the peace, basically uh, banging on the door of an ex-girlfriend's house. Got. To, uh, don't believe any charges were filed, but I'm only visiting this topic right now to the point that it might affect this fight. Worth noting that this fight was booked. He was theoretically in camp for it, and uh, that was at least one night that he, you know, probably didn't uh, make two a days. The thing is, even if Dumas was laser focused for this and not spending nights in jail, uh, this is a bad matchup for him. Uh, Ruzaboyev is a promising prospect. He, he's one of those guys that came out of the CIS. And I, I've said before, they don't build prospects there the way boxing prospects in North America and Europe are built. They just throw a bunch of 18 year olds in the shark tank together and kind of see what floats up. And because of that, he has some early losses to bad fighters when he was like 20 years old. But for the time that really matters, say like the last five years, he's been on a run. He's something like 12 and one in his last 13. He's won nine in a row. Uh, He's still just 30 years old and is really coming into his own. Uh, you know, he's a pretty big middleweight. Like, he's not one of the Titanic ones, but good athlete. 
good kickboxer, good wrestler. Uh, a little, uh, he's not as rock solid on the ground as you would think when you look at his record and see he's got like 20 submissions, like a little frantic, a little sloppy, a little, uh, a guy that's spent a lot of time on the regional scene in, in the CIS and was used to kind of doing whatever he wanted to with badly overmatched fighters. It's the kind of approach that will eventually get him in trouble at the UFC level. But I mean, it, it hasn't through one fight and the fact that he is relo- relocated his training. He's now training at Henzo Gracie Philly. I, I mean, if you want to get your ground game, nice and rock solid, it would be hard to pick a much better camp than that at, at the moment. This is just a bad look for Dumas. What we have in Dumas, I mean, he has 10 professional fights. Cruzaboya has like, I think, 40. But Dumas, he is a big middleweight. Not the heaviest, but tall, long arms, long legs. And uh, he does have all the weapons offensively that you would expect a fighter with those physical gifts to have. Uh, He throws nice long punches with good snap on them. He has uh, an arsenal of good, like his kicks are all nasty. He does throw them to all levels, you know, good head kicks, uh, good, you know, leg and body kicks. Uh, He has a fast guillotine for people who come in and try to, uh, try to wrestle them. I, I mean, guillotining everyone who shoots on you is not a recipe for long-term success, but uh, it's, I mean, it saved him on the, on the contender series. Just, I, I don't see anything he has. that's really going to work on Rizaboyev. I, I, I think Rizaboyev is a better overall striker than Dumas. I think he'll, uh, he should be able to wrestle and get Dumas down. And if, if he wants, and once he gets him down, like this is all elementary, uh, Give me Ruzaboyev by first round submission, but first round TKO on the ground wouldn't be on outside of the realm of possibility either. Yeah, so um, I'm going to do this. So for for a couple of reasons, I'm, I'm going to make my response very short. So there's 14 fights on this card. So to make this one a little bit shorter, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give a very short response. The second thing is with my plumbing issues that I had, uh, the, you know, I had to cut some tape study. This was the one that, that got cut. And the third one, you mentioned I'm, I'm, you were being very professional because you are the professional one. I am not. Dumas is a terrible human being. He's he's a criminal. Uh, I'm a police officer. I'm not going to pick a criminal. You know, if you commit a crime once, okay. I mean, everyone everyone can make mistakes, but... You know, I, I don't think people who commit crimes are necessarily bad people. But when you commit crime after crime after crime after crime, like you stop getting the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I mean, this is a guy I talked to a victim that claims that he pistol whipped her, sent me a, sent me personally the picture of her eye. Is that true? He was never arrested, never convicted. But it's one of those with this smoke, this, this fire. I mean, he's been arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. He's been arrested for multiple domestics. I think he's been arrested three domestics already. He's been arrested twice already since he's been in the UFC short, you know, short time. He got arrested with shoplift. And I, I contacted uh, Pensacola, Florida police and got police reports. And I looked, seen his juvenile record. I can't comment on his juvenile record because it's juvenile, but it's worse than this. <laughs> so uh, screw this guy. I, I say, yeah, Roosevelt's got a lot of experience. He's he's a long, lengthy guy himself. He's he's pretty athletic. He's got good, you know, leg kicks. He's got, you know, you know he's he's a good. I, I agree with your gra- grappling. I think it's, it's it's more of a fun scrambly kind of grapple than than a locked out submission kind of guy. But uh, I'd say he finds a way to get the fight to the ground, and and he submits Dumas, and hopefully that's the last we see of this guy in the UFC. I see he does in the first round. All right. I'll second round. I'll say you said first. You said first round. I'll say second round. Third from the top at UFC on ESPN 54 is a middleweight matchup featuring former champ Chris Weidman against Bruno Silva. Weidman, the 39 year old Long Island native, is 15 and 7 overall. He's 11 and 7 in the UFC. Uh, a run that took place primarily at 185 pounds, though he did have a brief foray up to light heavyweights. Uh, he did, of course, win the UFC. 
middleweight title with a shocking second round knockout of Anderson Silva a little over 10 years ago. He defended it against Silva, defended it against Lyoto Machida, defended it against Vitor Belfort before uh, losing the title about eight years ago to Luke Rockhold. The bad news is that starting with the Rockhold loss, uh, he is two and seven in his last nine, has had a couple of surgeries uh, to his neck and, and back, and in general has just looked like a ghost of himself on the once a year or so that we've actually gotten to see him. Uh, he's on a two-fight losing streak. Uh, a little under three years ago against Uriah Hall, he snapped his leg in 17 seconds uh, in a scene eerily reminiscent of what happened to him or what happened to Anderson Silva against him in their second fight. Uh, he came back last August and dropped a unanimous decision to Brad Tavares where he made it to the final horn, but looked like a, a pale ghost of his former self. Uh, he's fighting here in what amounts to a hometown fight. Uh, you know, he was at one time, one of the most popular fighters in the UFC. New Jersey is certainly going to treat him like a native son. And, uh, the UFC is putting him in a matchup that offers him some chance of, of winning in front of the supportive crowd in the form of Silva. 34 uh, year old Brazilian is 23 and 10 overall. He is four and four since joining the UFC as a former uh, middleweight champ in M1. He won his first three fights in the UFC all by knockout, two of them in the first round, uh, announcing himself as a person of interest in the division. Since then, he's one and four, and he's on a two fight losing streak. Uh, Got, he fought three times last year, knocking out Brad Tavares in April, getting choked out by Brendan Allen in June, and dropping a unanimous decision to Shara, Shara Bullet Magomedov in October at UFC 294. So, Silva, it's not beyond the realm of possibility that his future employment with the UFC is uh, hanging in the balance here. Weidman, I mean could be looking at retirement at any time, presumably, maybe even hopefully, depending on how you fall on that. But uh, Silva is a prohibitive favorite here. He's minus 300, Weidman plus 225. Keith, what does it say that Bruno Silva has looked nothing like himself for the last three years, and yet he's a three-to-one favorite over Chris Weidman? <laughs> yeah, it's because Chris Weidman is absolutely – Wash, I, say, I hate to say that he's one of my all-time favorite fighters. He's, he's, mm -hmm. you know, his his run, um, it was short-lived or shorter than it could have been, but it was fun as hell. I and mean, he was as dominant as as anybody. I mean, he, he if went. you love the wrestle boxers, which we both do, but you love him even yeah. more, he, he's on the Mount Rushmore of wrestle boxers. Yeah, I mean, the run he went on, obviously the two innocent solo fights, the. Leoto Machida, the Vitor Belfort. I mean, these guys were studs, and he and he 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 dominated. Uh, Chris Weidman. The the problem is is he's a guy, and it's sad we see this in the sport. And a lot of that has to do with they don't get these million dollar contracts. And I was watching uh, uh I was watching uh Pacheco's fight. Uh, the contender series, and they were they interviewing his his opponent afterwards. His opponent had this like real great motivation speech with uh, Laura Senko, and <laughs> he started talking about like, uh, my mom works twelve hour days. I can't wait to buy her like buy her something, put her on vacation. And so I'm like, dude, you didn't just get drafted, <laughs> you know? This ain't the NFL, <laughs> you know? This ain't the NBA. Like, you just got a contender series contract. You know, I mean, unless, I mean, let's just send your mom to Fall River. You know, uh, I, I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what you, you know, where, where, where your mom wants to go on vacation. But uh, you know, Wyman's just hanging on. He, like he, he does really good on that countdown show. Maybe he can do something with the UFC. He's a fun. He's got a good personality. But I mean, you watch his last fight. His volume really dipped. He's still trying to work behind a jab, but his his hand speed is is all but declined. He was never the fastest puncher to begin with, but now it's like it looks like he's he's in slow motion. You know, uh, he was never a power puncher, doesn't kick at all. And obviously, you know, due to broken leg, we, I don't expect to see him. You know, <laughs> looking like Leo Machito with the kicks anymore. Uh, he he used to be a really good wrestler, but I mean, you saw you saw against. Brad Tavares, he, he did a wrestle. In, in fairness, I don't know if 
trying to take down Brad Tavares and controlling him on the ground is is the best idea. You know, it's worth the effort the of what you're able to do. So that that could add something to do with it. Uh, I could see him maybe going up a body and trying to clinch and like you know press against the cage and like stick your leg behind his your opponent's leg and try to sweep him out stuff like that. Uh, do some of those old you know older wrestlers like to do. He's always been a really good grappler if the fight hits the ground. Good cup, top control. Um, he likes head and arm attacks, subs, front head locks, that kind of game. He is a submission threat. But the biggest concern is just the slew of injuries he's taken. I mean, even before the broken leg, people forget this. He had a slew of injuries before that. <laughs> oh, know, the, he he's, he's had spinal fusion. There you go. Yeah. Like he's, his, his body was failing him way before the broken leg. Um, I, he's got enough shit on the back of his neck. Looks like you could plug him into the matrix. Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice job. Nice job. Uh, I, I just, I think his, his chin might be gone. Uh, he, I mean, he was dropped out and, or knocked out in several fights before the broken leg, you know, Bruno Silva, a dude is so like said, he looks good. One fight looks bad. In another fight, um, uh, but he's on a bad run right now. He he likes to fight both stances. He loves a brawl. He he he's a wild man. He wants to throw down. He loves like closing distance with flying knees, tons of looping punches. He has serious power. I mean, he he knocked out Brad Tavares. So you know, if we, if you're playing MMA math, it's 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 in his favor. He he doesn't have the best technique though. He he also he, you know he likes to throw from his hips. Uh, you know, trying to beat his opponent his opponent to the point of contact. A lot of guys could do that to Bruno Silva. I think at this point, Chris Webbing can't. He's, I think he's too slow. But he overextends on his shots, leaving it open for counters, leave, leave it over to be taken down. Uh, he gets tagged up in every fight. I mean, he got pieced up by Gerald Murshot. Uh, he's, he's, you know, even got like Jordan Wright had success landing on him. He, he can get to the clinch and work there. He got a lot of takedowns on, on Sharabut and Mega Madoff, but he didn't do much on top. He stalled. Um, he's a very poor, weak defensive wrestler. Well, it's determined. Andre, uh, actually, Andrew Sanchez, Jared Merchett, they all took him down. He struggles to get back up. Even though he's a BJJ black belt, uh, he has zero substance in, in his career. I don't like this matchup. I I think it's like I've never been crazy about the UFC matchmaking. I, I really I, – I don't think the guys are – I mean, I, I'll give them credit when they, when they do a good matchup. I – this one makes no sense to me. At, at this point in his career, a former champion like Wyman is best used to get over the next big th- best thing, and you know it doesn't make sense. Or you know the next rising prospect in the division, it it doesn't make sense for him to face a guy like Silva. That said, this is probably the highest level opponent that he actually might have a chance to beat. Like you know, that said, if Wyman wins, no one's going to believe in him. You know that he's back to his old self. Like, yeah, she could ha- he could have a nice moment in New Jersey, and and have a very, you know, pro Weidman crowd. But no matter where he fights, other than fighting in Brazil, you know, even a part of Brazil where Silva's from, they're gonna be pro Weidman. If he fought in, you know, Vegas, if he fought in, uh, I mean, obviously New York is where he's from. But if he fought in L.A., if he fought in Chicago, like everyone's gonna be pro Chris Weidman. He's a legend. He's a you know, the guy knocked out Anderson Silva. Like, he, he's a big, you know, he's a good personality. So put him in Atlantic City because, you know, he's close to his Long Island. Like, whatever. Like, it, if Wyman loses, you're wasting Wyman's shine on Silva, who has zero buzz, who's 30-something years old himself, who's not a contender. That's why the perfect opponent for Chris Wyman would have been at UFC 300 against Bo Nickel. And I'm not just saying that to get my Bo Nickel references. If Wyman beats Nickel, people would believe in him. He's, mm-hmm. you know, he's, oh, yeah, Chris Wyman's back. He beats this guy at UFC 300, or he retires at like UFC 300. What a moment for him. It, you know, it would seem bigger. But if Wy- if Nickel wins, he just beat a former champion. He's not beating Cody Brunger, who's probably a, probably a tougher matchup right now than, than Chris Wyman is. But he beats Chris Wyman. It's UFC 300. It's he's so much bigger. I understand why I'm in close to the city, but it just doesn't feel right for him to be fighting on a meaningless fight card against a, I don't want to say meaningless opponent, but kind of. I think Weidman is completely shot. I say Silva lands a huge haymaker. I say Silva knocks him out. I'll say Silva does it the first round. 
Yeah, uh, you managed to sum up the. I hope the, I'm wrong. Uh, I, not, nothing against Bruno Silva, but I hope I'm wrong. No, I com- com- completely on board there. Uh, you managed to sum up the pointlessness and the looming tragedy of this fight on on so many levels but the pointlessness is what gets me and i agree with your assessment of the matchmaking here because you know of of the two of us you tend to be the more ruthless one like if if (laughs) chris white well if chris white wants another fight by that you know he's gonna get knocked out why don't you make it a benefit for your for your company dude why not just throw hamza fucking shemayev in there Right, like yes. you want, yeah, that's, that's really fucking ruthless. Okay. Well, but I'm, I'm saying if, if that's what you want, or if you just want to give him a a soft, soft, softball, where okay, th- this guy, short of signing someone just for Wyman to beat, this is the best we could do. Like that person is several steps down from Bruno Silva. Because, yeah, Bruno Silva is, is not what we thought he was when he got to the UFC, but Nick, he's still been Nick relatively Diaz? competitive against some decent fighters. <laughs> what about Nick Diaz? He is, is they, can they get him back in the cage? Uh, like, can Duran win step back in, or does he have to, like, win a fight <laughs> against the stairs at the PI to, like, you know, is that his, like, play into to, like, you know, his pigtail to get to wide? No, I, I don't know. Like, because, yeah, this is, well, it's kind of like, Chris Gutierrez versus uh, Frankie Edgar. It, well, it's, no, it's it's not even – it's more pointless than that because Chris Gutierrez was on like a five-fight win streak, and it was a good name to give him as he went towards the top 15. This still was not near the top 15. Uh, I think Weidman is as physically shot a fighter as I've seen in the UFC. I, I'm trying to think of the last time. Like, I mean, there are fighters yeah. who've been older, but in terms of just severe injuries that have changed the yeah. fighter he is, he's probably the most physically shot fighter I, I've seen and, in the and, UFC. And all the talk up to the, the week, it's going to be when they interview, oh, I feel great. I'm in the back of the gym. I feel like my old self. I'm ready to make a run. It's going to be all the same shit we've been hearing. Yeah, and none of it's going to be true. Yeah. I, at his best, Chris Weidman... Uh, like you can argue that nobody in MMA history made as pure a boxing style as that work on that high level. Like the way, I mean, he stood like a boxer, like just the, the shuffly footwork, the, the stance, everything about it. I mean, he was kind of like middleweight rampage Jackson, like similar stance and approach in the boxing <laughs> Still speed. He, yeah. 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 He, he's, he didn't he's have rampage Ramp- power, but yeah. Yeah. He's what rampage should have been like more willing to wrestle and always in great shape. But yeah, like he, his boxing was crisp and solid enough that it was very successful, even though he usually was the slower fighter. And I mean, he didn't have Rampage lights out power, but he wasn't a one punch knockout guy, but he knocked out some guys and he he hurt some people on the feet. Yeah, he was, he was so great uh, in his heyday. And then it all just came crashing down real fast. And, and we knew it was, we knew it was going to, cause even on his way up, he was having some injuries. Uh, just, yeah, it's been so bad. Silva on the flip side. I, I want to speak very carefully here. Cause again, I have no proof. I, I, I don't want to be even accused of slandering anybody, but he is the poster boy for why I always say on these previews, when a fighter comes from, South America, the CIS, you know, some parts of Asia with a really shiny record. I want to see him for at least a couple of full camps in the UFC before I draw conclusions. Because if you look at pictures of Bruno Silva in his first two fights in the UFC, and just a year later, he does not look like the same man. The physique is just, he looks like a different human being. And his, he look. I mean, he got slower. His cardio got worse. His power uh, waned. Like, I mean, Gerald Mearshart was having pretty good success on the feet against him, and Mearshart is one of the slowest 185 pounders in the division. Like, something has changed with Silva. Not saying what it is, but I mean, there there are only a few likely suspects. Having said all that, even this very compromised version of Silva he still swings hard and he still swings enough, especially in the early going, he's going to give himself every chance to hit Weidman. 
I mean, Wyman literally has no head movement anymore. He ha- his his cervical spine is fused. But I'm with you, man. Silva catches Weidman with something first round, knocks him out. It'll be a sad moment. I don't know if he retires or not, but I'll, I'll be kind of crossing my fingers. Would love to be wrong. I'd love to have him win and then retire, but, you know, we, we work with what we get. With that, we come to the co-main event of UFC on ESPN 54, a welterweight matchup between Vicente Luque and Joaquin Buckley. Luque, the 32-year-old, well, he was actually born in New Jersey, though obviously, you know, grew up and spent most of his adult life in Brazil. But uh, New Jersey born, I'm sure they'll, they'll root for him like a native son. He is 22, 9, and 1 overall. He is 15 and 5 since joining the UFC out of season 21 of The Ultimate Fighter. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying it's been a long time, but he came out of the ATT versus Black Zillions season. And I think Black Zillions has changed his name seven times since uh, since that season of tough. So, uh, yeah, he is coming in off a win. He took a unanimous decision over Rafael Dos Anjos in the headliner of UFC on ESPN 51 last August. That was his only cage appearance of last year. Uh, he had a rough 2022, uh, losing to Bilal Muhammad and Jeff Neal, kind of uh, – the show, those showings against a couple of top 10 fighters appeared to to set his ceiling in the division, but he did come back with the win over RDA and he will look to make it two in a row here against Buckley. 29 year old St. Louis native uh, now training out of Detroit, 17 and six overall, seven and four in the UFC. Worth noting that he's seven and four overall. He's two and oh since dropping the welterweight. Uh, he was primarily a welterweight before joining the UFC. Uh, that includes a run in Bellator. But uh, he came to the UFC as a 185-pounder, racked up some impressive wins, including a couple of the best knockouts in UFC history, uh, lost back-to-back fights in 2022 to Nasruddin Imavov and Chris Curtis. That prompted him to drop to 170 pounds, where he fought twice last year, knocking out Andre Fialio in the second round and taking a unanimous decision over Alex Morono in uh, October. Odds here are pretty close. Your favorite is minus 135. Your underdog is plus 115. Who are they, Keith? Uh, look at that favorite. You are correct. Luke is the favorite. Uh, also worth noting that Buckley is a replacement opponent. This was going to be Vicente Luque versus Sean Brady. Uh, Brady withdrew from the fight in steps Buckley, but it it will be six weeks by the time they get in the cage. So, you know, it's not like it's a real short notice thing. But, uh, yeah, worth noting. Uh, who wins this one, Keith? And and what does it look like? Um, man, six weeks. <laughs> Buckley's a great seven week fighter. I don't know, you know, six <laughs> weeks, I'm not sure. Definitely. Uh, uh, this is, this is a good step up for, for Buckley. And I think he deserves it. So, um, I mean, Luke, Luke, I mean, we know what you got, you got to get good volume from him. You got to get pressure. He's, he's, he's always been an absolute fearless guy, constantly moving forward and, and taking the ground. He's, he's been a plotting, uh, boxer with his high guard defense, good jab, uh, good short, tight, crisp combinations to follow, uh, throws straight down the pipe. When he gets in the pocket, he may loans violence. The problem is he's always been defensively flawed. He, he lacks head movements. Uh, he, he's, he showed the roles, which I've never liked. He's, he's a guy that he's going to eat a shot to land one of his own. But he's always been insanely durable, insane toughness. I mean, you go back to like the Stephen Thompson fight, the, the, the amount of damage he ate in that fight and still stayed in. He's competitive, the same with Jeff Neal. Uh, the problem is he's starting to show signs of a decline. I am a little worried about his chin, uh, you know, based on the amount of damage he's taken. Uh, good leg kick game. I love how much of a grappler he's become in, in, in later in his career. I mean, he was always a good underrated grappler, but he's gone to it the well so much more because um, it has prolonged his career. I mean, you know, years ago, if you asked me who would win a, a, a fight between Vicente Luque and RDA and you told me one of them really controlled the wrestling, I would, I would have guessed the RDA did it. But sure. for him to be able to take down RDA and control like he did, yeah, sure, I understand. It's not you know, 2000, I don't know, 2016 RDA or 2017 RDA, but still, it's still a, a solid win. He's a weaker defense wrestler. I mean, Bilal Muhammad took him down at will, but in fairness, Bilal Muhammad takes down everybody. Uh, he's a very good Grappling, he's got six wins. He loves that Darce joke. 
Uh, you know, people try to name it after him because of how many times how many times he's got it. Uh, he's hard to sub, and and he has cardio experience mindset to go the, the hard the entire fight. Uh, Buckley, I mean, his athleticism is second to none. I mean, he's is explosive and quick, and as as you can see, southpaw. He, he looked really good in his last fight. I was I was really improved by his output. Like, where, where did this come from? It's only he's this like high output striker, fast hands. He's short, compact. He always has these powerful hooks. Great ability to land a power shot in the small places. A very different style than a lot of people. Bob and Weave style. Um, he. He uses feints really well to set up his shots, kind of get his opponent guessing, like what we saw him do against Jordan Wright. Uh, he, he rolls with punches hard to land clean. One. Like very few people, I mean, like Chris Carter's caught him clean, but a lot of times, it, it, you know, you land again, it's more grazing. Uh, he does well to cut off the cage. He does well to sit back and then kind of dart into position and, and throw power shots. I like his, over, his straight left. Uh, I, his last fight, he was really measuring his shots. You know, getting a lot more accurate. I like that he works the body. Uh, his output has improved. I mean, he had, people remember, like, Chris Curtis knocking out. He was winning up to that point. His volume looked really good against Chris Curtis. Quick high kick knockout over Andre Feely with, with a beautiful kick. Uh, obviously, he has that all time great knockout, uh, you know, possibly the greatest knockout of all time against um, Impa. You know, yeah, Epic Saga Knight, who's actually done really well since. Oh, yeah. To his credit. Yeah, to his credit, really well. Uh, uh, very underrated wrestler, Buckley. As we go back to like the Alisson fight, he took him out five times. Very smart. Like, he's a guy that he could have, you know, he's got the power. He could he could have caught Alisson, but he went, hey, I've seen Alisson fight. The way to beat him is, is wrestling, smart enough to go there. Uh, he has been taken out in the past, but I was impressed in the Albert Dariah fight, like how many takedowns he he stopped. Like I don't think that's a weakness necessarily anymore. But he's on top. He's got good ground and pound. He showed improved cardio against Al Hassan. It, it's just you know his chin. Like he was caught clean by Curtis. Can he can Vicente Luque do that to him, or can can he, can he create a scramble and catch up? Then I think we I think we have a little bit of a war. I think both guys are going to have moments. Give me the guy who's three years younger and, and doesn't have as much wear and tear. Uh, I, I think we might have a little bit of a passing of the torch moment. Uh, I think Vicente Luque might be showing some s- signs of decline, even though he you know he just went 25 minutes with RDA. and he, I think this might be a little bit you – know, he might be slowing down a little bit, and this this could be where the escalators you know, meet. I think Luke will get a takedown at two, but I think Buckley's going to land the better shots. I think it's going to be a really close fight, maybe debated, but I'll see Buckley wins a split decision. Yeah, man, I I like that pick, and I can tell I'm going to go against you and already knowing that you're right and and I'm wrong. It is impressive because looking at the way Buckley came into the UFC, just very live by the sword, die by the sword, you could have seen him developing or or failing develop to develop and just becoming a fighter that just looked for the kill shot and lost fights if he couldn't find it but you're right he's he's starting to find other ways to win fights and he's starting to win rounds and that makes him a whole different problem to deal with at 185 or 170 Uh, i agree that he was doing well against curtis until he got caught and you know what curtis is a very good fighter, a very good striker. Uh, in his last fight, Buckley was favored to beat uh, Alex Morono, but that's exactly the kind of trap, like that could have been a trap fight. It could have been a fight where Buckley lost rounds just because Morono always marches forward so furiously or fearlessly and, and throws volume. Like, let alone if he managed to get uh, Buckley down, where I, I think the, the difference in ground game w- would have been stark. But no, like Buckley not only threw enough uh, volume to win rounds. He kind of took Morono out of his game with it. Uh, yeah, that's that's a different and more dangerous guy to deal with, and it's easy to forget that he's not even 30 years old yet. It just feels like it should be older because, again, my first memory of the guy is just him getting used as a takedown dummy by uh, Logan Storley way back in you know Bellator. I also agree with you that as fun – as Luke has been and as good as he's been like as competitive against very good fighters. It's not a style that's built for longevity. It, it It's the fun's got to end sooner or later. 
maybe this is the fight where it happens. Maybe this is the passing of the torch. Maybe this is where the, the escalators pass one another. Historically, Luke has been incredibly durable. Now, Buckley can put a strike on somebody that is going to knock anyone out regardless of their durability, but I'm going to pick that Luke has got enough left in the tank that he can take a shot or two from Buckley short of what he killed Impa Kasanga and I with. And uh, Luke is still a guy that is constantly putting pressure on his opponents is willing to use his underrated wrestling and very underrated uh, ground game. Give me Luke to, to scrape out a decision where here, where he wins two rounds and the round he loses it's because Buckley knocked him down and he just managed to survive. We didn't get a 10, eight round or we didn't get a finish. Uh, so yeah, Luke by, by decision, but, I say that, and there's part of me that says, nah, Keith's right on this one. This is going to be the, the, the coming out party for Joaquin Buckley. But uh, I'll be the square and take the favorite here. That brings us to the main event of UFC Atlantic City, a women's flyweight matchup between Aaron Blanchfield and Mount Fior. Blanchfield, the 24-year-old New Jersey native, is 12-1 and overall. She is a perfect 6-0 and in the UFC. Uh, fought twice last year. Choking out Jessica Andrade in the second round in February, then coming back in August and taking a unanimous decision over Tyler Santos. She will look to make it seven in a row, probably mint herself the presumptive next title challenger in the division once Alexa Grasso and Valentina Shevchenko settle their business. Uh, but to do so, she will have to get past a woman with the exact same goal in mind in the form of Fior. 34 year old French woman is 11 and 1 overall. Like Blanchfield, she is a perfect 6-0 and in the UFC. Uh, she fought just once last year, taking a unanimous decision over Rose Namajunas, uh, who fought just this past weekend. Uh, prior to that, she had a unanimous decision win over Caitlin Sermonara at the time, Chikagian, at UFC 280 back in October of 2022. Odds here? Slightly favor the younger woman. Blanchfield is minus 160. Fiora is plus 130 on the comeback. Uh Keith, this is it. One of these women is going to be a perfect 7-0 and in the UFC. Both of them have been fighting former champs and perennial. I mean, each of them has a win over a former champ and a uh, former title challenger yep. in their last two fights. It, it's surprising kind of how much their tracks have mirrored each other. But one yeah. woman has to take a step forward on Saturday. Who gets it done and how? Yeah, I'm torn because I, I like both of them a lot. I don't really want to see the one when they both kind of – we were backers of both these women before they were ranked fighters, before they were kind of viewed. We were – we. I, I don't think – have either one of us ever picked against them? Oh, I, you know what? I picked against I I picked against Fiora in her debut because I did not okay. – realize how good she was going to be i've been I, i've been right ever since <laughs> i pitched i picked against honestly i picked against blanchfield and uh, jessica Andrade fight that was pretty that was a bad pick but uh but generally speaking we've we've been, been backers of these yeah. two so um it's it's it sucks to see one of them that we've been supporting before was really popular to support them um lewis uh, yeah I'm a fan of Blanchfield. I mean, I've said this before. I'll, I'll continue to say it a million times. You know, she's 12 and one. She should be 13 now. She she beat Tracy Cortez. I'm gonna keep saying that until she she loses a fight. Uh, she she's she seems to be improving as an athlete. I mean, she looked much faster in her fight against Jessica Andrade. Her her hands were faster. She pressed with volume. She's a pressure counter striker. Slip and rip. Uh, she's failed. She's walked down her foe. Being so young, she, she hasn't come into her power yet. Uh, but she was landing uh, shots against Andraj. Uh, I think she made adjust adjustments against Talia Santos, where she was landing some good shots in that one. Uh, she throws a lot of leg kicks, though she doesn't check leg kicks. Uh, she does have that going way back in the day. She has a credible KO knockout, uh, high kick knockout of Victoria Leonardo. But that one, you know, I, I probably should take that one out of the notes. If she can get the fight, she's not a sh she's she's got good entries and she gets to the fight to the ground. Um, you know, she, she's. She's a wizard. I mean, she's got a good single leg, good, got it running the pipe. I, I was impressed at how easily she took Marina Maverick down, and and it's you know didn't age well. Then it started it's starting to age well better now. Uh, she's still you know she's not Tatiana Suarez, so that's still my concern when it comes to her wrestling. Like she can get it down, and she's tricky, but when she gets someone who's really a strong takedown defense, how will she do? But she gets to fight the ground. I mean. 
in, incredible top pressure, smothers them, some of the best ground and pound. She's, I've said it before, she's got a mean streak where, she, where the fight hits the ground. I mean, she beat the piss out of Molly McCann with a nasty crucifix. She's a BJJ black belt. She's a former EPI world champion. She's a bit of a submission specialist. I mean, she sub Molly McCann with an amazing Kimura. She choked out Jessica Andrade. Uh, she's very promising. And obviously, the crowd's going to be on her side. She's from that area. Uh, Manon Ferro, huge flyweight. She's a southpaw. She moves well, light on her feet, uh, moves to avoid strikes, cuts angles both offensive and defensively, so it's kind of hard to either trap her or to avoid her which way she's going to go because she's going to come at you sidestep one way or, or something to kind of land strikes off the center line. A technically sound striker. She got some quick hands. Uh, she <laughs> she knows how to like change it up from power strikes to just volume kind of scoring points like she'll throw some arm punches kind of just conserve her energy but when there's an opening she'll step in she can crack uh, i love her lead front hook uh, she's got a good kicking game fantastic teep kick she's actually an underrated wrestler i mean she's got some good entries she took down caitlin jacagan down in the fight in a close fight late late in the in, in the fight to kind of give herself a win which is really smart good top control uh though she doesn't have a submission on her record so like obviously i'm not saying that she can compete with Blanche Bell in the fight, uh, you know, on the ground. I like both fighters a lot. Uh, Faro should be the better striker, where Blanche should be the better grappler, and it com- comes down to where the majority of this fight happens. Faro is much bigger. Uh, I think she's probably the better athlete. She hits harder. And I I say she lands the better shots. I think Blanche Bell's going to have moments. She's going to get to the clinch. She's going to get to her entries. going to you know, try to run the pipe and that. I just think Ferro's going to do it enough to stop some takedowns, uh, have enough of her own moments. She might drop a round or two, but ultimately I think she upsets the hometown crowd. I think Ferro wins a decision. I hate picking this fight, man. Uh, I, I like everything you threw out there. It's it's impressive to see uh, how Blanchfield has improved well, I mean, while staying functionally undefeated, has continued to improve and has improved in ways that you don't always see. Like, you, you don't often and, see fighters. Sorry to interrupt you. And she's only, I, one thing I, should, I didn't even mention, she's only 24. 24. She, 24 she's, she's not even close to her prime. Yeah. So she could make, she could make, like I'm saying, like she's not, you know, explode through your hips kind of wrestler. We could see that next time. She could be knee tapping. Who knows? So sorry I mean, to interrupt. No, it's it's uh, it's a good point, and the gap in age that they are uh, nine years apart in age, basically. You know, Fjord just turned thirty-four. Uh, Blanchfield turns twenty-five in, in a month or two. If Blanchfield wins, we might look back and say that this is the closest Mono Fjord ever got to a title shot. The opposite is not true. If Fjord beats Blanchfield, Blanchfield could win her her next six fights and be right back there. Like, unless yeah. she just gets completely blown out, it's not going to drive her that far from the title picture to lose no. her. Assuming she does lose. It's on, on one hand, I agree. Like Fjord obviously is the much bigger woman. Uh, she's an outstanding boxer has good, solid power. Like the, the knockouts have dried up for her once she kind of moved up to the top 15, top 10, top five level women, but it's given way to something else where she's winning fights and just imposing her own pace on on the fight, really not giving her opponents too many, even like moments of hope or, or uh, of offense. I think we may learn here that Manon Fior has always been a woman who was built for five round fights. Like, this, it, it wouldn't surprise me because as big as she is, it wouldn't be surprising if cardio turned out to be a problem for her, but it hasn't yet. And she hasn't even looked especially spent in, in any of her fights. She's, she hasn't always made it look easy, but she's just made it look very straightforward so far part of me like wants to lean towards Blanchfield just because she has di- like a wider variety of ways to win, to, to win the fight. Like she certainly could have some success on the feet, 
she has good one shot power. She's a constantly improving striker. And then obviously there is her ground game. But I could just see this really turning into a mono fuel fight where she wins four out of five rounds with her boxing. Blanchfield maybe gets a takedown or two over the course of the fight, but Fiora is successful at getting back up to her feet pretty quickly. And the takedowns just get harder and harder for as Blanchfield has to keep working so hard for them. And Fiora just isn't getting tired. Uh, I'm with you. It's a, it's a bit of an upset. I mean, she's, she's plus plus one thirty, but I, and again, this is a fight that might look completely different if they were doing it even a year from now. But I think Manon Fior is the woman of the hour. I think she wins here. And I think it's just a shame that she probably has to wait another whole year before she actually gets a title shot out of this. Uh, but yeah, it's a, a unanimous upset pick in the main event. And that is it. The Sherdog Radio Network preview for UFC on ESPN 54, Blanchfield versus Fior. I've been Ben. He has been Keith. If this is your first time watching or listening to one of our previews, first of all, thank you. We hope you enjoyed it. We do our best to bring a, a palatable mix of actual in-depth analysis and the occasional historical or humorous aside. Uh, please do like, subscribe. Uh, those things cost you nothing. It makes us feel good. And it helps us to continue bringing these shows to you for free. Uh, Drop us a comment. Keith and I both man the comment section. We would love to hear your take on these fights. We've both picked some upsets here and kind of waffled on some others. So if you've got some picks you feel really strongly about, let us know and we will give you all uh, the credit if you turn out right. Yeah, at least at least post at least post one prediction in that. Just give us one yeah, fight. Po post you, one post prediction one. or yeah. Uh, Let's get those comments and, up. Yeah, and. Uh, Come join us for the recap. We are live on the Sherdog sure YouTube page right after the main event. Keith takes the captain's chair. We will talk about all 14 of these fights in reverse order, going from that headliner all the way down to the, uh, the card opener. We'll talk about what was good, what was bad, what was surprising, what was controversial. There's always something. Talk about what's uh, next for some of the notable winners as well as losers. And we'll be talking with you because the live chat is open that whole time. So we're taking your questions, your comments, and your hot takes in real time. We have a growing group of friends who hang out with us after the fights, and we would love for you to be part of it. Between now and then, thank you once again for listening. Enjoy the rest of your week, and by all means, enjoy these fights. To the Make your better fairy tales while you